and Michael Remus. Hey, what's going on, everyone? It is game day. The champs are in town, Winnipeg and Vegas tonight at Canada Life Center. Great to have you with us to set it all up on Winnipeg Sports Talk Daily. We've got lots to get to today, including a visit from my old pal, Gary Lawless. He, of course, is in town. Got a chance to go out for dinner last night with he and his broadcast partner. And uh, we went down to the rink this morning, got into the room, talked to Mason Appleton, and actually had a little one-on-one with Rasmus Kapari for the first time as well. So we'll try and get that on the show for you a little bit later on. Um, You know, we were actually in the room for most of the time while the players were on the ice. It was a... It wasn't a long morning skate. Certainly, I think, something far from what we saw going into the home opener against the uh, Florida Panthers or or last game. Um, But a few lineup changes, which we'll get to in a minute, including a scratch for Nate Schmidt. Logan Stanley coming in, and uh, sounds like Mason Appleton is going to be uh, riding shotgun with Shifley and Connor on line number one to start the game tonight. So we'll dive into all of that. Uh, Brandon Rowicki is going to jump onto the program. Ken Weeb as well. And then uh, we'll have a little sit down and fun. And we're not just talking hockey. We get a little bit about the summer in Vegas, uh, you know, with the Stanley Cup. But Gary always wants to talk bombers as well. So we'll, we'll certainly do that a little bit later on. As they say, a pretty busy show today um, going into tonight's game. Um, I, uh, tons of feedback on yesterday's show. Uh, and in particular, our conversation about the attendance right now. And, um, you know, Michael did a great job, Remo, of putting out um, for people that maybe missed the entire show, uh, just some clips of sort of what we talk about because it was the better part of the first half hour of the program. If you missed it in its entirety and you want, go back if you missed yesterday's program and first half hour is sort of when we uh, when we kind of dove in on that. And listen, I appreciate all the response. I'm not surprised it is a video that so many people are watching, and I'm not at all surprised that it is a video that so many people are responding to. Um, And it's interesting. I mean, some people strangely took it like I was putting it on the fans. I I, Not many. Um, And I certainly don't think that is uh, the case. I mean, listen, this is a very, very complicated, complicated issue, and there are a bunch of different factors in. Um, societal factors, economic factors um, that, you know, have played into it. I mean, some of it is completely out of True North's control and a lot of it has and still is in True North's control. So I think the bottom line of the takeaway is that um, while that crowd on Tuesday was really concerning, I'm expecting probably these next weekday games tonight, next week against St. Louis uh, will probably be similar from what I understand. Um, and it is, it, it, I mean, listen, it is incredibly concerning for people that have lived through Jets 1.0, losing a team, getting a team back. Um, but as they say, I'm not looking to, um, and I don't want the point of all this to be just a bunch of people pointing fingers in the blame game as to who's at fault. Um, <clears throat> my goal when we're talking about this um, is what can be done to um, to to stem this right now to turn it around and to move it forward and uh, hopefully have uh, many, many, many great years of Winnipeg Jets hockey for the fans, for our city going forward. So I just want to say that thanks for all the comments, both on the YouTube channel, via Twitter today, wherever you saw the the, uh, the content. Um, Obviously, I mean, unfortunately, this is not just going to be something we talk about for one day and then move on because I think, you know, at least for the time being, this is going to be something that is a bit of a cloud around, you know, the franchise, the fan base, and the city because of how important the Winnipeg Jets are to us. So 
Just wanted to get that out of the way. We are going to really more focus, though, on uh, tonight's game because, of course, the Jets get a shot at the Vegas Golden Knights. And, uh, you know, one thing that came out of Mason Appleton's uh, comments today was that this is uh, a big game for everyone in that locker room, um, thinking back to how they finished last season and the way they went out of the playoffs. So we're going to get to all of that on the program. Great to have you with us. And great to have the amazing sport of the Winnipeg Sports Talk sponsors that make this show happen each and every day. Our partners at CoolBet had a great lock shop just finish up with Dusty and Pat Gregoire from CoolBet. Check that out at the Edmonton Sports Talk. And uh, we've got some pretty fun exclusives for tonight as well with a big, big slate of games in the National Hockey League. ALCS and NLCS back in action and NFL football. Certainly an awesome, awesome sports night. I also want to thank Princess Auto, Canadian Club, Modern Man Barbershop, Manitoba Battery and Aquatech, Vita Health, Wallace and Wallace, F Apparel and Nick and Nicky DQ. Of course, our friends at Boston Pizza. Those BP lounges will be busy with all the uh, action tonight. Uh, Little Brown Jug, Royal Sports, Consolidated Supply as well. Let's get right to it. Welcome to everybody in chat. Hit that thumbs up button if you haven't already. And give a warm welcome to Michael Remus into the program today. What's going on? Wow. What an introduction. Thank you, Huss. And Nate, great actually seeing you. This morning, nice seeing you and Gary getting together at the rink. Uh, they, it was big optional skate, so I don't think anyone was really skating. We saw Nate Schmidt and Declan Chisholm skating after, but that was the big talk. And yeah, we saw who Shane there and all the local guys, who Jamie Thomas, Paul Edmonds, Clinton, and the writers as well. So uh, nice to get out of the house once in a while. Huh? So we were there. Yeah, uh, we got got in the room. Good. Good chat with Rasmus Kupari. Got a question in for uh, Mason Appleton. So doing some uh, doing some work there. Yeah, you know, I mean, listen, my schedule, um, you know, with now lock shop being every day at noon makes it difficult to get down for practice, especially when it's later than 1030 and usually kind of getting, you know, back to, to you know, really like to listen to the head coach and Bones. Um, but again, I know it's great to be down there. I mean, to connect with everybody and, you know, get in the room, sort of, you know, uh, say hi to some folks in and around it. Um, but today we were able to pull it off and uh, obviously got together with Gary as well. So we'll have that a little bit later on. Um, you know, this is going to be a, I mean, a big test for the Winnipeg Jets. And, you know, it, it, it's a test in a couple of ways. How this team responds to their first, you know, poor game of the year, if you want to call that. And listen, I love the start, and we were all at the game. I mean, as much as, as I mentioned yesterday, I was sort of preoccupied with looking around, going, where the hell are all the people, and what is up with all the empty seats? I mean, that was just sort of something that was, um, you know, kind of, I mean, you could not uh, not acknowledge it. The Jets, for their part on the ice, I thought had a great first period. And, man, they had some big, big chances that didn't go in. The crossbar for Josh Morrissey. Um, but they were very much in that game. What was concerning was the way the next 40 minutes. I mean, L.A. completely took over in that second period. Uh, and we can talk about the refs all we want, but um, they were certainly the better team. There was no question about that. Um, and then with the lead, they squeezed the Jets in that third period. And, you know, it was nice that Mark Scheifele got one. He's now got three goals in three games. He's had a great start to the season coming off that contract extension that he signed. Um, but what a test the Winnipeg Jets have coming right back at it against a team that many would argue is even better at doing the things that the, that the LA Kings were successful against Winnipeg. And um, I think Mason mentioned earlier today, I mean, they've all got a bad taste in their mouth at the way the season ended. Um, and I do think that this will be an energized team going into a really, really tough test. And also another side of this, Remus, is uh, you, you can tell from speaking with the players, how much respect and how much they really like Loren Brassois. Brassois is making his first start today in his return to the Winnipeg Jets and gets an opportunity to do it against his old team. Uh, and this will be a special one for LB. And you know that everyone in that lineup is going to want to bring their best for the guy in net. Rick Bone is saying yesterday for LB, they had penciled this game in at the beginning of the season for, you know, if it was Vegas or not. And you have to wonder. Uh, how many games is he going to get this year? You know, they seem pretty reluctant. Well, they were reluctant to go to David Ridge uh, down the stretch, you know, leading to Hellebuck playing, you know, he, among there for goalies, games played leaders. So they have confidence in Brossois. I think he's going to get more games than we've seen. And 
if he can stay healthy, you know that he's a, a quality goaltender, and he was awesome in the playoffs last year until getting hurt. And I mean, it's got to be kind of. I mean, you're happy that your team won, but probably you know wish you were, were healthy for it. So Brossois, I don't know if this is quite revenge game narrative, but may, maybe it is, and we'll see what he can bring tonight. I think Hellbuck probably good for him to have a rest. As we've said, you know, he's played so many games. Nice to have a goalie you can trust as a backup. But, I mean, he hasn't been the the Vesna Trophy nominee, Connor Hellbuck, this year. And maybe he's able to get right. And this is going to be a tough one on Saturday against Edmonton. And then on defense, Nate Schmidt, um, you know, just him and Brandon Dillon, they were on for a couple goals against uh, last game. And uh, you look at the goals against leaders at 5-on-5, five five, it's Schmidt and Dylan at the top of the list, uh, you know, Schmidt on the ice for four against at even strength, and Dylan on the ice for five against. Bringing in Logan Stanley, his first game action. Uh, Coach Bonus saying likes Stan's size as you're playing up against a big physical team. And I don't know if we're going to be seeing like playoff style hockey here, but you know Vegas can bring it, and they're undefeated on the season, so it's going to be a tough test. Well, listen, that's the way they play. I mean, that's the way they're going to bring it. I don't think there's any question about that. I mean, if you've spent any time watching the first week and a half of the season, you've seen the Vegas Golden Knights win four times and lose zero. Now, they did go to a shootout against the Dallas Stars, but, I mean, that was a big win for big win for uh, for Vegas. They had not ever beaten Jake Ottinger in the regular season. Now, they, they beat him when it counted in the Western Conference Final, but Dallas had really had their way with Vegas over the course of uh, the regular, the recent regular seasons. And I mean, incredibly, and I know some people don't pay too much attention to this, but I mean, the betting line on that game was Dallas was a favorite in Vegas. So, I mean, here come the Knights four and zero out of the gate to start the season with their, all their Stanley cup rings and a lot of confidence as they should have being where they are right now in the uh, landscape of the national hockey league. And a big test for the Winnipeg Jets. And you mentioned Nate Schmidt, Remo, being benched tonight or healthy scratched. And Logan Stanley coming in. Listen, I know Stanley has his detractors. And he's obviously in a pretty precarious situation being, you know, when everybody healthy, the eighth defenseman on this squad. But he's in the lineup tonight. And this is a team that, you know, brings a lot of physicality. We've said that, you know, Logan, for the size that he brings to the Winnipeg Jets, just hasn't shown that often enough and consistently enough. Um, I would hope that Stanley, first and foremost, plays his game, makes the smart play, doesn't get too fancy. But I got to tell you, if I'm Logan Stanley right now, knowing that I'm getting the call to play tonight against Vegas Golden Knights, um, this is a game that I come out ready to throw my body around and meet the physical challenge of the Vegas Golden Knights. His team needs it, and he needs it personally to, I think, establish a little bit more confidence within the coaching staff. That is why they're putting him in, and uh, if he can deliver that sort of a performance, I think would really help his personal standing when it comes to uh, to this lineup. And Interesting to note as well, I mean, Nate Schmidt being scratched against his former team, that's probably maybe a little bit more difficult to do than just an average game on the regular season. So take that for what it's worth. But to me, a big opportunity for Logan Stanley. Yeah, 100%. Um, you know, we had the report last year uh, from Frank Cervalli that Stanley had requested a trade. He'd kind of fallen out of favor. He got passed on the depth chart by Dylan Sandberg. And, I mean, even more competition this year at camp with Billy Hainala in the mix and seem to be having that spot that uh, maybe Nate Schmidt has until he got injured. And for Stan, yeah, he's going to have to come in, make an impression. Uh, Rick Bonus says he wants to see size. I don't think Stan has been uh, the most physical player for a guy who's six foot seven, but he's going to have to be a, an intimidating force for sure uh, against Vegas and like moving the puck, making smart plays. Um, you know, you know, Stan, big Stan has got a, a nice shot on goal too. He takes a lot of shots and, and they do get through. So, um, and they did mix up the pairs uh, today, Hus, because it was Dylan and Schmidt. Now we're, they're keeping Morrissey DeMello together. Dylan is with Pionk. You got the young guys, Double S, Stanley, Sandberg together. And I think there was some uh, left to right uh, stuff going on there where Schmidt's a, a righty or Schmidt's right D and Dylan's left D, but Stan's left D. So Sandberg can play right and they're moving him to the right. 
Yeah, so that's the way the blue line looks. <clears throat> and we'll get to this more again with uh, with Brandon and Ken as they uh, jump on throughout the uh, throughout the program. Um, the other thing is Mason Appleton. And listen, we were there today in the room, and Appleton certainly sounded excited for his opportunity. And he did play at times last year with Shifley and Connor as you know Rick Bonus went through a whole myriad of options trying to get things going. I will be honest. I think we talked about this a little bit yesterday. I mean, uh, I'm a fan of Appleton. I'm not sure that this is really the role that he is best suited into. But and we'll play this a little later on. I think he realizes that his job is to go in, be fierce on pucks, to win puck battles, something that Gabriel Velarde did so successfully. Keep that puck in the offensive zone and find a way to get it to 55 and 81, who have really started off this season you know, with their uh, with their offensive games looking very, very good. Yeah, they were off. To, I mean, it's such a shame, Hustler. Like, who's the script writer for this Jets season? We have the great story, Billy Hainala, you know, finally getting gonna about to get a shot at the NHL, and he it gets injured. And then we have, oh, Gabe Velarde coming over from the trade, finding a home, elevated to the top line. <laughs> Mark Shafley scores, you know, as scoring, they're looking great. And, oh, he gets injured on an unfortunate play. So um, it's really tough. But for Mason Appleton, and I kind of agree, you know, maybe playing a bit above where you'd normally slot him at the top line. But they like, they like you know, what they like him on the forecheck. They like that he's a right shot. Played with Connor and Shafley before. There's some familiarity there. So you'll give it a shot. I do like um, what it means for some of the other lines. Has I think, this, uh, what... I have fallow Lowry Nieder Rider line. Uh, certainly interesting. And- I'm excited about this mm-hmm. line. Now, uh, uh, granted, I could see this line not being together by the second period if things don't go well up front yeah. with Appleton in that spot. I mean, I think on paper, I have fallow or Nieder Rider probably brings a little bit more pop and brings a lot of what the coach is looking for to that top line. But this may have to. This also may have to do with how much that Lowry line is going to be playing tonight, and the matchups that they're going to be playing against. Um, on paper, to be honest, Nito and Iafalo with Lowry is as good of a Lowry line as I think we've seen put together in a long, long time. And um, you know, granted, if everyone was healthy, I think that would be a, a heck of a way to see things go. Um, but that's not the case right now. The other big thing up front, and you know, we're talking about that line and how the top line looks. Um, we're also going to see a bit of a different look on line two. Um, listen, we've spent plenty of time talking about Cole Perfetti and the challenge of being center in the middle. We know that he's had a little bit of a rough ride early on, and that line has not done a lot, partly because I don't think Ehlers has been very good right out of the gate. And listen, we'll give him a mulligan for the first week of the season because he basically missed all of training camp and uh, was probably well behind his teammates, um, you know, going into that opening game of the year. But this team needs a lot more from Nikolai Ehlers. I was just talking about Ehlers and, you know, getting the puck and shooting the puck and getting it on net, um, which hasn't happened enough so far. I have a feeling that he shoots the puck quite uh, a, a lot this week, uh, this tonight in this game. Um, other Part of it is that, you know, Vlad Nemetsnikov moving into center and, you know, what a Swiss Army knife he is. Um, he and Ehlers looked really good together last year during the limited time that they played together. So I think they're looking to maybe take a little bit off Cole Perfetti's plate, have a veteran like Nemetsnikov come in, do what he's proven he already can do. Um, but at the end of the day, this second line is going to be led by Nikolai Ehlers and Man, uh, Ehlers barely played in that series. I mean, he got into that final game, game five, which was such a disaster. So uh, maybe we'll see Ehlers be a bit of a difference maker tonight. Hasn't been that so far, but we know that he's got that club in his bag, and it would be great if that one comes out tonight against Vegas. Yeah, I would love um, to see Nikolai Ehlers get on the board. Zero points this year so far, and uh, he did it click a little with Nemestikov. I think Perfetti's got some nice vision. We'll see how he plays after taking that big hit. I'm sure he's he's, he's fine, but um, it was certainly uh, concerning last game. But the Nikolai Ehlers play, Murat mentioned this yesterday, and I completely forgot about it, where Nikolai Ehlers is like point blank in front of the net, and he's about to get a shot off, and <laughs> rifles it all the way, not even over the net, but over the glass. Like, he was so close. It was actually impressive to get it over on that angle. And he's on the bench, and he's... Uh, I don't know, he put his hands in the air like this. I don't know if he was, like, upset about... <laughs> I was sitting the, beside you. Yeah, that was hilarious. I don't know if he was upset about, like, you know, 
blowing that chance by not even getting a shot on net and shooting it over the glass, or he's going like, it's good, field goal. Uh, <laughs> I, was, I mean, it was a wild, a wild play, and you know he's got a great shot. We've seen it. So, uh, he, look, you need him for, uh, for zone entries. You can find, you know, Perfetti and uh, Nemesikov. But, yeah, if, I, if I'm playing with Cole Perfetti, you got to have your stick on the ice and ready. Uh, ready. Maybe we'll see him use his great shot. You know what? Let's uh, let's get to uh, a quick couple minutes of bones um, from the uh, from this morning um, after the morning skate, and just while Remus gets that ready, um, interesting news out of Pittsburgh: uh, the Jensen Harkins experiment with the Penguins has lasted four games, um, and I know that you know he right out of the gate was on the third line for Pittsburgh. Uh, it doesn't seem to be. Uh, it, it listen. It just doesn't seem to be uh, like he's going to be sticking around there very much. He's back on waivers. If he does clear, we'll confirm this with Ken. But my understanding is that he will, you know, can revert back to Winnipeg and would be with the Manitoba Moose. And maybe that's not such a bad spot for Jansen right now, because as much as I don't think he was necessarily in the plans right out of the gate. He got his opportunity with Pittsburgh. He's going to be back. He realizes this is a guy that's on the fringes of the National Hockey League. But with the injury that's taken place to Gabriel Velarde, with a player like Mason Appleton at this point moving up, um, you know, maybe in a week or two, there's an opportunity for a guy like Harkins to come in and get another shot with the Winnipeg Jets. Um, if nothing else, he'd be a big addition to the Moose, who... You know, have Dominic Toninato down there, but a bunch of young players that have had nice starts to the season. Um, um, but I, I, I would not be adverse to uh, seeing Harkins back in the organization and at some point getting another shot. Um, but that's the uh, the latest out of Pittsburgh. Uh, Harkins placed on waivers today. All right, uh, Brandon Rewicki's coming up in a minute. Let's get to uh, this morning's post-morning skate conference with Rick Bonus. He talked a little bit about the lineup for tonight and the changes that he's made. Can you go yes. in for Nate tonight? Yes. The, Nate would be considered a healthy scratch? Yes. Okay. What's the reasoning or thought process? There's, uh, first of all, the team's given up way too many goals. We are. we got to tighten this thing up. Um, there's a couple of areas of Nate's game that we need him to work on. We're very clear with that to him. So, um, you know, Logan gives us that big physical presence back there. This is a very big team we're playing tonight, um, and we needed some size back there. Uh, Logan would give us that. Yeah, I was going to ask, like, Declan obviously would be an option as well, but is, is the physical element? It's the size factor, yeah. They're a big team. They go to the net hard. You had uh, Brendan and Neil together in practice. So will Dylan and Logan play together? Yeah, but the problem when you take Nate out, there's that right side, right? And Logan doesn't play right side. Dylan Sandberg has played right side in the past. So that's really why that move is being made. All right, so there's uh, Bones talking about the uh, the defense core. So Stanley in, playing on the left side. Dylan Sandberg playing on the right side in line two, Dylan and Pionk together, and uh, I'd imagine we'll see a ton of Josh Morrissey and Dylan Tomello tonight. Um, that's the story on the blue line. Here's the story up front. Mason Appleton getting the call. As a bonus all but said yesterday to Mike McIntyre when he was asking about Rasmus Kapari skating with those players. Here's the uh, here's uh, bones on uh, Appleton getting the promotion. I'm um, just one on Mason Appleton. Obviously, there's a lot of depth, uh, more than maybe ever with this forward group. Um, I guess in your mind, why was Mason the, the first guy to kind of get a crack? And could we see others maybe get a look there? We'll, we'll see. Well, you know, this, we have lots of time. Yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, we have too much time with that. But no, Mason has played with those guys before, and they like having a right-hand shot playing with them. And so you put those two together, and Mason's the logical guy to go up there. That doesn't mean Rasmus won't go out there at, at some times, but uh, we, we like what we saw last year when Mason was, was played with those guys because of injuries. We're in the same situation this year. Uh, again, he knows them. They know him. And, they, and having a right-hand shot there, yeah, that's important to those two guys. He had that one season a few years ago where I think he scored 12, but his, his offensive numbers have never maybe popped 
at this level the way maybe some had thought. But do you feel that there's a little more offense there from him uh, that, that we could see? Or Yeah, we're hoping to see that. We need him to go to the net. When you play with those two guys, you've got to make sure you're going to the net. And Gabe was very good at that. Now, we, we Mason is Mason. We don't need him to change his game. The, the, the way he plays the game, that's how he has to play, even though he's playing with those two guys. He's reliable defensively, strong in the boards, strong in the corners, but he has to get to the net for sure with those guys. All right, there's Bones on Mason Appleton. Yeah, Appleton's got to be a dog tonight. I mean, got to get in the corners, win some puck battles, do what Gabriel Velarde was doing so successfully in those first couple games in the first period against the L.A. Kings, playing alongside Kyle Connor. And Mark Shifley will chop it up with Rewicki and Ken Weeb. And don't forget a visit with Gary Lawless later on today as well. Looking forward to that. Um, hey, uh, shout out to our friends at Modern Man Barbershops. Our, our Movember team is growing, by the way. Big shout out to One Bird and to Derek Schmidt, who have joined Julian as our first three members of the WST Movember team. If you would like to join us, going to try and maybe get a few perks from our friends at Modern Man for um, the select few that make up the WST team. So um, all you basically got to do is grow a stash. We'll get some pictures. We'll have some fun with it on WST and obviously hopefully raise some important money for men's health throughout the month of November. So big thanks to Julian Wunberg, Derek Schmidt. If you do want to join the crew, send us an email, winnipegsportstalk.com. And uh, we'll get that going for the month of November. Of course, Modern Man, eight locations now in Winnipeg with their newest locations on Pemina and Plessy Road. Might need a stash shave for the fellas to the, for the uh, start of the uh, the month, or certainly one at the end if they want to. Maybe they just become mustache guys. You never know. Uh, of course, they've got haircuts, beard shaping, shaves, color services, and more. Make an appointment and book your look via modernmanbarber.com and give them a follow on Instagram over at Modern Man Barber Shops. Uh, pool, well, it's still gorgeous outside, but pool season officially over. If you're thinking about a pool for next year, take the plunge with Aquatech. They are the experts. But what you might not know is that whole home renovations start with Aquatech as well. With thousands of renos as their foundation, Aquatech can upgrade any space in your home. If you're ready to enhance your kitchen, bathroom, or even add a man cave to your home, visit aqua-tech.ca to learn more about their whole home renovations, including financing options. Um, Got to give a shout out to Donnie and the gang at Manitoba Battery. Of course, they've uh, powered us through an amazing summer with the best prices on batteries for, you know, your boat, your uh, Sea-Doo, your lawn tractor, your camper. Now it's time to get serious though, because the Winnipeg winter is serious and your car needs to be seriously ready for it. Uh, if you do need to test your battery to see where you're at heading into the winter, you can always pop by 1026 Logan Avenue to help you out with that. But if you do need a new car or truck battery, shop local, get the best price in town. Manitoba battery beats the pants off the big box stores when it comes to pricing. And even better yet, you won't even have to leave your home because Manitoba Battery will deliver it to you anywhere inside the perimeter of Winnipeg at no charge for any purchase over 60 bucks. It's just that easy. Head on over to manitobabattery.com to order and see everything available, or you can give them a call at 783-8787 or pop by and see Donnie and the gang at 1026 Logan Avenue down at Manitoba Battery. And uh, hey, looking like another great crowd for the Bombers on Saturday. Three straight sellouts and the opportunity to officially clinch the Western Division Saturday night game. Sounds like a great day for some football and a few Canadian clubs. Of course, CC is Canada's favorite whiskey in the official spirit of the Winnipeg Blue Bombers and Winnipeg Sports Talk. CC and Ginger also available throughout the stadium and at your local Manitoba Liquor Marts, along with the full Canadian club family of products and, of course, you can grab CC and Ginger in 473 milliliter cans at your favorite beer store as well. All right, let's uh, get Brandon Rewicki in here to get ready for the Vegas Golden Knights. Rue, what's going on? How are you? I'm doing pretty good, man. Just just finished a dog walk. Actually, I, I heard somebody talking in his phone for anybody that's feeling a little down right now. I don't know if it was just like a note that he was giving himself or what the deal was, but he just talking to the phone saying, Last time this year, it was snowing. 
Have yourself a great day. And then they just turned his phone off. So I was like, all right, this dude's this dude's got it right. Yeah, so I'm well, going with that. I appreciate the positive vibes right now. Uh, it was it, listen. We won't spend too much time on this, but I mean, listen, I couldn't really get into the game on Tuesday without sort of starting about how uh, concerning that crowd was is right now. I mean, what do you make of the uh, the way things are kind of shaping up right now for at least the early part of this season and uh, the empty seats that we saw when uh, Dubois came back with the Kings on uh, Tuesday night? I think it's insanely concerning. I, I yeah the, the the good vibes are gone by the way, um I I mean you, you can't sugarcoat it this we we've seen this song and dance before here in Winnipeg like we're always going to be a little more sensitive to it than than any other market in the NHL, but I mean when you've already got the lowest capacity of of any arena, that's not a college rank in the NHL like it, it's got to be full most nights for it to be sustainable, so I I, I think it's a big big time worry. It's funny because it's one of those things, Hus, that everybody has their take on. This is why it's it's going this way. This is who's at fault and, and everything like that. Um, I, I think all the reasons people are bringing up are, are completely valid. Um, the one thing I'm not going to do, though, Hus, is blame the individual ticket buyers. Because the prices to, to go to basically any pro game are, are just vanity. I mean, when you're talking about a family of four needing a thousand bucks to go watch a hockey game. I can I'm I'm never going to I'm never going to say it's the fans fault when you know prices are what they are all over the place and if you've got a family to feed it's it's a pretty easy decision hmm do I do I have a thousand bucks to spend or do I want to get groceries for the fam for the rest of the month so I'm I, I'm I'm not going to blame any anyone saying you need to support the team this that I'm I'm never ever going to blame the individual fans but I I think there are a few things that the organization needs to do a lot better um some of it may be tangible and some of it intangible. Um, but is is it concerning? Is it a worry? I it has to be. And and it has to try to get figured out sooner rather than later, because I don't think uh Gary over there in New York is gonna be as lenient with the Jets as he is with his head boy, the Coyotes. So Oh, hopefully it's just a blip, but it, it is very concerning. Yeah, listen, the bottom line is, and I'm sort of with you, and again, I mean, a thousand bucks. I mean, hey, I got seats in the upper bowl. I mean, obviously it doesn't cost that much. I mean, if you want great seats, you want to be sitting on the glass or something, well, I mean, it's the National Hockey League. That's what the cost is. And uh, But to be honest, I mean, the concern wasn't as much the lower bowl um, was the upper bowl. And I mean, that is sort of, I mean, I think that speaks to fans that have been lost um, that were part of season ticket groups in the past where before there was this big waiting list that evaporated and now listen the bottom line is and again you know I know there's a lot of people that you know are, are kind of specializing in the blame game right now and to me I think there's a lot to go around um, and a lot of stuff that's completely out of people's control I mean let's uh, I mean Listen, I mean, Remus, you know, ask people that have a mortgage where that's at right now, how much your child care is. I mean, there's a whole bunch of things that... You know how much diapers are? Like, yeah, come on. <laughs> I don't, actually, but uh, I hear. <laughs> I, <didn't think> so. <laughs> I, I hear there. Maybe that's why I can afford season tickets. Yeah. I don't know. Um, but, but listen, I mean, I think what, um, what the majority of people are, are obviously concerned, very much invested in this, and want to see things happen to move this thing forward. And um, listen, there's a lot of work that's going to need to happen in those downtown offices. I think we all agree about that. And um, let's just hope that um, that things get going. And we'll talk about it more. But as I say, I'd love to be more of a, uh, you know, people like in this space, you know, as far as not talking about who we're pointing fingers at, but try to, you know, have some real solutions going forward. And um, again, that, I mean, everyone wants that and wants the best for the city, the team, the fan base and all that. Um, but it's not, it, there's no easy answers to it. I mean, I guess that's the, that's the simple yeah. thing. And that's what kind of came out of what our conversation was, uh, was yesterday. Um, you know, and it was, it was sort of, that was a bit of a shadow or a cloud over the game. I mean, we had such a great time and thanks again to the WST crew that came out. I mean, it was so great seeing everyone and we had a great time before the game and had a great time sitting together and watching it. The game itself though, Brandon was, was so frustrating in that, you had a really energetic first period where there were a ton of scoring chances that didn't go in. Some good fortune from Cal Talbot, some good saves by Cam Talbot. But we got into a bit of a Pacific Division slog there in the second and third period. And when 
The Kings took advantage of a couple power plays by the Winnipeg Jets and had that lead. This team did not have a lot of answers, and uh, holy smokes. I mean, I think they it was a bit of a wake-up call for a club that, you know, certainly, you know, had had six periods of really good hockey, albeit only one win to show for it after that tough one in Calgary. Man, does the uh, it gets ramped up even more tonight because this Vegas Golden Knights team has the championship pedigree. They've got a confidence. They've got a real deep lineup. They play a style that wins in the playoffs and in the regular season. And this team is 4-0 and tonight. And um, I'm really interested to see how the Winnipeg Jets can uh, hold their own uh, at, on home ice against a Vegas team that uh, right now, frankly, is the measuring stick in the National Hockey League. Yeah, and I mean, look, the, the Jets took it to them in game one of the playoffs last year, but there was no doubt by the time the series ended who was, who was the top dog, right? So... It's uh, it's they they do a lot of you know what the Kings do as as well has and the Kings give the Jets some trouble there where they're big deep and physical, and whether it's the blue line or some of the the forwards up front, it, that that that's always kind of exposed some of the underlying issues with the construction of this team. So yeah, like it, it's it's a fantastic test. There's no doubt about it. Um, but I mean that that L.A. game, man. I mean that's I, I don't know if you could have dreamt up a, a more worst case scenario than how it played out, right? Like. Just a freak injury, and and it's uh, I mean injuries like that too is always why I kind of hesitate calling some guys injury prone because Velarde obviously had the the back concerns a little bit before, but I mean anybody gets somebody rolling into the back of their leg and then have it fall awkwardly like that, you're like you're gonna get injured, right? And and it was just a massive blow, and especially when that top line was performing like one of the league's best through the first two games of the season. And I mean, that just kind of said like an ominous foreboding tone of, of what was to come there. Um, and I mean, look, the refs didn't help him out. Let's be honest. Uh, you're calling interference penalties when guys have the fuck, let alone the the whole England boarding fiasco. Uh, but the Jets just never they, they, they never really got their groove like they did in the first two games. They, they weren't able to establish the four check that was so dominant um, against Calgary and then against Florida as well. They struggled in their own end at time. It was just you're right. Slog was kind of the perfect word there. And then to top it all off, you know, Connor Hellebuck lets in for sure a couple of softies. Uh, I mean, one, you know, like he'll first to admit it that it was nowhere near an acceptable level of performance from Connor Hellebuck. So it, like, it was just a crappy night overall. There really wasn't anything good that happened, to be honest. Even even the good things that happened, like Sandberg stepping up for Perpetti, Sandberg gets his face beaten. Right? Like oh, it was God. just one of those. It was just one of those rough nights. And I'll, I'm intrigued to see what the bounce back is going to be like, though. I mean, there's the lineup decisions for one, but. Yeah, uh, like the first two period or the first two games of strong play can be wiped out pretty quickly if this club is one and three and the games don't get any easier in the next stretch as well. This needs to be pushback night. Pushback night against the Vegas yeah. Golden Knights. Something that, you know, unfortunately wasn't there. And you know, we talked to Appleton after practice today, and there was a big crowd around him talking to him about getting the opportunity to, to slide up the lineup to play with Shifley and Connor. And, you know, he said Straight up. I mean, these guys still have a bad taste in their mouth about the way that the playoffs ended. Um, and I think they, as a team, have the opportunity to really make a statement today, uh, you know, against a team that, you know, as I said, right now is the measuring stick in the NHL. Um, are you surprised that Appleton's the one that's going up? Yeah. I, I'm surprised at all the lineup decisions. Like, I I don't like it. <laughs> I, I don't really get the reasoning behind it either. You know, it, it's funny because Kupari got the the jolt up the lineup there against the Kings. He looked pretty good, right? And and that that is probably like the least intrusive move you can make to keep the rest of your lines intact. And no one was all that great against LA, but the forwards looked pretty good through the first few games. Um, it was just a lack of production from everybody outside the top line that maybe didn't bring to light just how strong everybody was. But, I, I mean, I, I like Kupari's speed. He's got a little bit of skill. He he seemed like he would be a pretty good fit there, at, at least, you know, for the first couple of games, and then you can readjust and see where things are after that. I, I mean, Mason Appleton didn't play well when he was on the top line last year. Like he was he was a bit of an anchor when he was with Shifley and Connor for that extended period of time. The second line, I, I mean, that, and I, maybe that's what even bothers me more than anything, Huss, is you have this grand experiment to put Cole Perfetti at, at second line center. Chevy says they drafted him at center. Bonus says he's got to get a chance down the middle. 
and you pull the plug after three games. Like you're not you're not even giving him much of a chance to. Sh- Who would have guessed that Patrick Liney would have more time down the middle than than Cole Perfetti to start the year? I, I like I, I feel like if you're gonna if you're gonna try to give somebody an opportunity at a new position, it's got to be a couple of weeks. It's got to be a run of ten games to get a decent sample to figure out. Okay, is this going to work or is this going to be something that we have to punt on? I I don't like the decision to do that after a couple of games and. I don't I mean look at the playoff teams across the league, Hus. They've all got better second line centers than than Vladi Demesnikov. And no offense to him, he performed admirably, more than admirably down the stretch last year when pushed into action. But I'm just not expecting him to be able to do that, you know, for, for a second season running here. Let me um, you, let me hit you with two things on that. Number one, like I don't think that uh, it's three games and Perfetti can't play center and that's it. Like I, I would be shocked if we don't see him back in there, continued some switching things around, especially while Velarde's out. If they were going to do it for a game or two, this is the game to do it. Like there is something about what Vegas brings that I think is a, is a huge challenge for a young player in that spot. So I'll, I'll, I'll say that, and again, we'll see whether I, I'm right and this is, you know, they continue to shift things around because I'm with you. I mean, I think to really know we got to give this young man some more time, but it hasn't gone well early on. To me, this is about Ehlers. To me, I, I mean, Nikolai Ehlers, and again, I, like there's a built-in reason, excuse, whatever you want to call it. The guy was hurt, didn't play at all in training camp, was a step behind all of his teammates when things got going. Um, but he hasn't been a difference maker at all so far. And I mean, that's been a big part of that line. And the one thing I think they can lean on was the fact that Nikolai Ehlers looked very, very good last year playing with Nemetsnikov in the middle. So I'm sure that that is the thought process to 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 maybe this change for tonight. Because um, I think we'd all agree that as much potential as Perfetti have, has and as much uh, versatility as Nemetsnikov has, this line is going to live and die on Nikolai Ehlers. And uh, fair or unfair, you got three games in the books, you're playing, you're healthy right now. They need to get more out of him. And, I mean, not only getting the zone, doing the things that he always does well, but shooting the puck and getting it on net. I mean, the shots haven't been there. We were talking on the lock shop today. That shot total is three and a half. I'd love to see that go over tonight because I think that if Ehlers can start generating shots on net, um, that's where it's going to need to start. And even when he's had glorious opportunities, as Remus pointed out earlier, I mean, he freaking put one not just over the net, but over the glass in the last game. So he hasn't seemingly been himself so far. And that is such an important, important thing to have happen for the Winnipeg Jets to get to where they want to be is to get 27 cracking like uh, like we know that he can. Well, that's why what happened during the preseason was was such a massive blow. Like this this is his preseason right now, but the games mean something, right? Like that that line needed reps together. They needed practice reps together. They needed preseason game reps together. And they got what a grand total of like 10 and those were in the first practice. Right, like they, I, I, and and Nikki isn't the easiest guy to play. Like, you, there's there's some guys where their game is kind of you know translatable and readable. And okay, I know he's going to be in this position. Like, there's a lot of unpredictability when Ehlers is on the ice, and that's what makes him so great. But if you haven't played with him before, and you've got a guy trying out a new position, and he's you know in his early twenties trying to figure his way in the NHL, like it was kind of a recipe for failure in the sense that you weren't likely to get great results right off of the bat, which is, you know, again, why I thought, put those three together again. Like, let's let's see them try to find their way early on in the season. And it's not like they were horrible. It's just, the, you know, the, the the production wasn't there for them yet. Um, and I, I think Ehlers is going to get better and better as as the games come along here. But this is what happens when, when you're out with injury <laughs> before the season starts, right? Like, you got to ramp it up a little bit and, and hopefully he does it sooner than later. To, to the Perfetti point, though, Huss, and, and I, I, I totally get like Vegas being who they are, big, bad, nasty, physical. To me, like, let's challenge the kid. <laughs> like, let, let's see what you got. Like, let's we're we're giving you some responsibility here. We want to show you that we believe in you. Like, help help us win a game here down the middle. I I, I would love to see the team go more along the lines of that. Plus, look, having him out there on the wing. 
Might not be the safest place in the world against the Golden Knights with the big wingers that they that, got in the defenseman too. Point so point taken, point taken. Yeah, there might not be a good spot to, to hide for Fetty in this one. Um, for, for me, though, it's just you, you kind of based your whole offseason around giving the kid the reins down the middle there. I get injuries happen. I get it sucks, all that. But like, if you're going to base that decision – even if it is only for a game or two where he goes onto the wall here, like just don't don't pull that plug early. Go with the growing pains and hope that by the time six, seven, eight games come around, he's he's starting to show some some big time steps, some potential, some strides. And him and Ehlers and, and Nino potentially could have been killing it by then. But it seems like that's going on the back burner right now. And Bones is Bones is searching for wins, and then he thinks this is the best lineup to give him that. Well, the the, the other kind of side to this <clears throat> that it allows Bones to do if he's, you know, putting Nemetsnikov up with Perfetti and Ehlers and Appleton is in that spot, is putting Niederreiter and Ayafala with Adam Lowry. And I would not be surprised, Brandon, when we look at the game sheet at the end of tonight's game, whether that line is right up there with the top line as far as ice time. And I will say this, I am... I, I'm really interested. I'd love to see these guys. Now, listen, the situation may dictate that in the second period, Nito Niederreiter is up in that spot, and those guys get broken up because of necessity. But if that, if those three guys play together consistently, I think that has the potential to be a difference-making third line, if you want to call it a third line, and one that kind of gives Adam Lowry more pop offensively and better two-way players than he's played with in a long, long time here in Winnipeg. Yeah, that, that's the only positive of the of the moves for Mijas is that, I mean, look, the third line carried them down the final 10 games of the regular season last year. They were, the, they were their best line, no doubt about it. There's a very real chance that that's their best line in the game tonight. Um, that can also be a good thing or a bad thing, depending on how you want to look at it. But just strictly from like that, the, the expectations for that line, I, it's it's pretty exciting, and and I follow's been, I don't know if a, a pleasant surprise is the right word, but he, I think he's been better than a lot of people anticipated him being, and and somebody that can be like a real real big boon to that third line there. I mean, how many third lines in the NHL have Nino and I follow type players on their third line? It, it's it's got to be pretty rare. Like we're talking about some of the best forward groups, I would think at least. So I I anticipate that third line having a massive massive impact on this game. Not going to shock me to see them go up against Eichel for the majority of their, their their time tonight. And it's kind of weird to say, but that's the line I feel most comfortable in going up against the Golden Knights because we know what to expect with those three together. So I, I think that's I think they're going to have a great game. Um, and it would be a great thing, Hus, if that's your third line for the rest of the year because it means the second line is giving you a lot, whatever iteration you're getting out of those two or those three. And that the top line with Shifley and Connor and whoever's out there on the right side is is able to give you some some stellar results. So um, if, if they can have that third line the rest of the year, that probably means the team's in a pretty damn good spot. Yeah, uh, you know, uh, point well taken. Uh, shout out to WST legend T. Kona Pauly, who just dropped in a super chat. Thanks, Pauly. You're the man. Uh, and this is what he had to say, as always, in all caps, as he is known to uh, to put in. Uh, it's funny how Jets realize Vegas is big physical Stanley Cup team, yet we fail to follow the motto to bulk, bulk up and toughen up and will re- remain a step behind as we get pushed around. That might be the biggest um, thing that we'll learn tonight about this club is their ability to stand up to the Vegas Golden Knights. Um, they weren't really able to answer them at all after the fourth period of the series. Um, you know, when things sort of turned around in that second period and Vegas got onto their game and started exerting their will on Winnipeg, there wasn't really an answer. And as we heard from Rick Bonus, there wasn't really that level of pushback. And, you know, honestly, this game could go, I mean, the Jets could win. The Jets could absolutely lose this game. They're a slight underdog in it. Um, but what I want to see and what I think a lot of the fans want to see is, is matching that challenge. And, And I'll say this, Mark Shifley, of all people, all season long, has been a guy that has had, I don't necessarily, like he certainly hasn't been in a bad mood outwardly. I mean, he's been really positive. He seemed to be a great teammate. But he, 
I mean, there's something extra to him. I mean, he doesn't care. He dropped the gloves with Matt Kachuk. He did a wicked WWE takedown in that uh, in that last game against the, there. And if Shifley's doing that, like you hope that 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 other guys see that. And there is no more team in the NHL considering the history between these two teams and what Vegas brings to the table, where you need not just to be emotionally engaged but ready to do exactly what Rick Bonus talked after game five, and that is pushback. And you might win, you might lose, you might get punched in the face, but you need to be able to answer that. And um, to me, that's another big test for Winnipeg tonight because if you don't have that, I think you've lost the game before you even play it against a team like Vegas. Oh, 100%. And and look, Lowry, Lowry wears the C. Morrissey might be your, your best, most impactful skater. Connor's your most dangerous forward but mark shifley sets the tone like he's he's not the leader like the de facto leader of the team but to me it always seems and i i I thought this going back to the early portion of last year when he was playing so excellently that when he's physical engaged back checking physical all that stuff the rest of the team has really no choice but to follow suit so and look he's gonna have to carry a bunch of the load now because they're they're depleted, they they lost Velarde, another big body too, right? He's he's gonna be out, have to be the guy that steps up here. I, I, there, there's no doubt about that. Um, you know, the interesting thing with Vegas Hus is everybody points to the size, uh, specifically on the back end, as as to why they're so successful and and why every team needs to copy that. Um, I mean, one, it's a little difficult to find six four defensemen like Petrangelo and Theodore that can you know, skate with the best of them and put up 40, 50 points on top of it. Um, but, you know, the Avalanche have a, a pretty tiny decor themselves. Um, and they're not the biggest team in the world either, but they they seem to have found some success uh, the past couple of postseasons as well. So I, I don't think size is the be-all, end-all. It's great if you can have it, but if not, I think speed and, and tenacity is, is going to get you a long way. And Jets, hey, you don't have the size, so then let's see a little bit of speed and tenacity in the game to go up against the Golden Knights. And it's 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 absolutely a big one. It's not only a measuring test, but like I said, two and two feels a hell of a lot different than one and three. And and one and three with Velarde out, who knows where Hellebuck is with his game right now because he hasn't been at his best so far this season. It's it's a it's a complete 180 those two records here. And I think we just, we, we need the jets to come out with a big one here to avoid kind of worst case scenario after that difficult six game stretch where they're facing playoff teams and they're likely to be underdogs in all of those games in those first six. Yeah. Energy commitment, that old cliche compete level. Um, You know, if you don't have that, you're not beating the Vegas golden Knights. And uh, that's what uh, myself and everyone that's at the game tonight, will be hoping to see. And uh, I'm sure the Winnipeg Jets within that room, based on what we heard from earlier today, um, you know, are expecting to see from themselves and their teammates uh, as well. Brandon, awesome as always. Uh, fill people in on uh, what's cracking on uh, skates and plates. Yeah, new episode tomorrow morning. Breaking down the game, as is custom in Winnipeg. Got to have a take on the on the attendance issues, but um, hope, hopefully we're hopefully we're breaking down a dub. That, that's that's pretty much it. Hopefully the, hopefully the game goes as good as the weather is outside. Yeah, no doubt about it. Thanks for doing this, man. We'll uh, talk to you next week. Keep it up. Sounds good. Have a good one, guys. All right. There is uh, Brandon Rewicki. Uh, we're going to go from uh, Brandon to Weber coming up next. Ken Weeb joining us. But as we mentioned, uh, and we'll, I'll get Ken's thoughts on this as well. Um, um, plenty of great seats available right now. So, uh, listen, if you're thinking about getting out, you got the Stanley Cup champs in town tonight. Big game. Next Thursday against St. Louis, a 745 game. That's the Super Tuesday where everyone's playing and all the games are staggered by 15 minutes. Um, and as we mentioned before, if you, uh, you know, were uh, one of those people that, you know, uh, had seats before or thinking that, you know, you would like to get back in, uh, I'm sure there's plenty of ways to uh, team up with folks, get a smaller package, or uh, get out there, um, because I think the uh, you know as much as we've you know again there's a lot of work to be done that has nothing to do with the fans and the fan base. Um, you know this team's had a had a nice start, didn't have a great game last time, but um, you know there's nothing like being able to see NHL hockey in your hometown in person, and uh, 
you know, hopefully we can see some more butts in the seats. So you can go to jets.com for all the information on ticketing. And of course, you know where to get seats and hopefully we'll see you there tonight. Um, let me give a big shout out to our friends at Vita Health Fresh Market. If you're looking for great prices on natural and organic supplements, very important at this time of year, beauty products, groceries, and Winnipeg's largest selection of local products too, get on down to one of six Vita Health Fresh Market stores or online at myvita.ca. And for those of you that are busy right now that might not have the time to get down to Vita Health, save time and check them out at myvita.ca, fully shoppable website. And if you get your order in by 11 a.m., you will get that order the same day. Um, and not to mention right now, a great time to maybe try shopping at Vita online. Um, for every, uh, you'll get a free gift if you um, place an order for a hundred bucks or more right now at myvita.ca. And hey, with the upcoming holidays and the stress of back to school and a lot of stress just in general right now, you can try Health First Ashwagandha Supreme, known for its stress lowering effects as well as helping anxiety, cortisol levels, and even stress-related food cravings. It's on sale all month at Vita Health. Vita Health Fresh Market, empowering people to lead healthy lives. Six Winnipeg locations and online at myvita.ca. Uh, you know Wallace and Wallace are the fencing experts in town, folks. You've seen their trucks and fences all over the city. What you may not know, though, is they're also the leader in overhead garage doors. Is the Clopay dealer here in Manitoba. And that overhead garage door of yours had a lot of ups and downs all summer, getting you and your family to all that summer fun. But in the winter's coming, and now it's getting real. Uh, that winter, that uh, overhead door is about to work a whole lot harder because winter puts way more stress on a garage door. The right time to prevent downtime this winter is now. Give Wallace and Wallace a call to book your inspection and maintenance service call today. For residential and commercial overhead door sales and service, there's only one name or two you need to know, and that, of course, is Wallace and Wallace. And, hey, let me give a shout-out to the guys at F Apparel. We saw Connor pop by the crew at the WST gathering before the game looking resplendent in his suit. Um, you know, we were a little more casual being in the stands for that game, but uh, whether you're a press box guy or whether you uh, just need to look good for the upcoming holidays – if you need to up your menswear game, guys, there's only one place to go, and that is F Apparel. Custom suits beginning at 400 bucks, along with chinos, golf pants, custom shirts, both tucked and untucked styles, and an incredible selection of menswear accessories. You really have to do, go in and just see all the options available to you at F Apparel. Best way to do that is to see them in person at 190 Smith Street. You can also make an appointment and check them out online at F, that's E-P-H, apparel.com. And don't forget, if you're having a wedding or in a wedding party, talk to the gang about a 15% discount for the entire wedding party when you get your suits at F Apparel. All right, it's Weeb's World time. Let's welcome in Ken Weeb, formerly of Sportsnet, just about <laughs> caught myself, now with the Winnipeg Free Press. Weeber, what's good, buddy? How are you? Great to be with you, Huss. Uh, great morning. Uh, caught up with the lawman and uh, the sheriff this morning, along with uh, the great uh, many of the great folks uh, covering the Vegas Golden Knights. So fun morning. Good to see you down at the barn, Huss. Great work. Uh, love to see the hustle. Can't can't knock the hustle there. Good work. Uh, great answer from Mason Appleton uh, for all the. <laughs> Sorry, I've been I've been sort of chuckling uh, about this. Uh, sorry to launch into an early buffet maneuver here, but uh, all we've heard about Huss about is about how the Jets should be stretching their lineup out and and spread some balance. Yet, uh, the moment that it's Mason Appleton going up to the first line instead of uh, Nikolai Ehlers, uh, the sky is falling in in the city. So uh, I love the passion, but. Mace gave you a great answer, Huss, as to why he is getting that job. Not everybody needs to be the most skilled or do the same thing when they play on a line. Uh, that's not to say that this is going to work perfectly and that that line is going to score three goals in the game. But Mason Appleton is going to be asked to do a very distinct job on that line. He plays a straight line game. He can play with speed. And he knows who he's supposed to be digging out the pucks for. Um, you know, personally, could I make a, you know make a case for Nikolai Ehlers trying to get him going because Mark Shifley and Kyle Connor are going? Yes, but Nikolai Ehlers is an East-West player. Uh, it's worked sometimes to perfection with those two guys, but there have been times where that line has got absolutely nothing going at times. So that's why the decision is being made. 
Um, you know, could you make it? I thought this week, Huss, you talked about it a lot leading into the season. I personally could have easily made a case for Alex Ayafalo moving up to that top line to show that, you know, Swiss army like versatility. But I also love what the Jets are doing with their quote unquote third line. This is the best version of that third line since Andrew Kopp and Brandon Tan have played on it. And I think you could probably make the argument that with Aya Follow and Niederreiter, there's even a little bit more offensive potential with that line. Uh, you and I talked a lot about Nemesnikov as potentially being a second line center, and that got shouted down from various corners that said, oh, in a small sample size, uh, he didn't have chemistry with Nikolai Ehlers, even though the players and the coach believe that they are, but the numbers didn't uh, back that up, if you will, in a very small sample. So there's a lot to be watching tonight, Hus. And then the bigger surprise happening today is when you turn to the right-hand corner of the room and oh, Logan Stanley just came off the ice with Dylan Sandberg and they're talking and oh man, are, are, is Logan coming in? Are, there going, are they going to be D partners? Uh, instead of just curious, being wondering about this Huss, I just walked right up to them and said, are you guys playing together? Uh, they wouldn't commit there. I said, well, Logan, are you in? He goes, yeah, I'm in. And I was like, okay, well, now we have a quick answer about the defense uh, core switching uh, quickly. And I know that there's a lot of folks, you know, curious about Declan Chisholm. So uh, I would think that if, uh, let me put it this way, Huss, and some people won't like this either, but if the Jets were playing the Edmonton Oilers tonight and it was going to be more of a speed game, I think absolutely Declan Chisholm would be the guy getting that first crack at it. Uh, but, you know, for all the people making jokes about size and everything else, Huss, there's no denying the Vegas Golden Knights are one of the heaviest teams in the NHL. Uh, they live and breathe around the blue paint. So Logan Stanley's on notice. You know what you're being asked to do. He's not being asked to fight five times in this game, but impose your will physically. Because if you don't, Declan Chisholm or Nate Schmidt are ready to be in the lineup on Saturday night. So uh, those are just some quick uh, quick yeah. thoughts from well, this listen, morning. There's, there's many, many servings from the buffet. I mean, you <laughs> went to about three different booths and been, but let's just start with where you finished. Sure. And then we'll get back to the forwards. Um, I get why Logan's the guy going in tonight. And for a guy that has somewhat fallen out of favor, I think you could argue that with a really healthy Billy Hanela, he is, or at least would have been up until oh, this no switch debate. today, eighth yep. on the depth chart. And that's if you include Declan Chisholm at nine. I mean, they're basically the extra guys. Um, this game tonight... I mean, if Logan Stanley was looking for an opportunity to get into the lineup and show that he can do the things that this organization wants from a big defenseman, this is the game. And listen, I don't know him well enough to know what's going on inside his head, but if he has done an accurate assessment of where he is right now in his NHL career, this is a glorious opportunity to go up, to add, to play more physical than he has in the past, to give the Winnipeg Jets what they need, and that is guys that will stand up to the Vegas Golden Knights for check, the onslaught, to play a tough physical game, to mix it up if need be, to stand up for his teammates. Um, because if that doesn't happen in a game like this, I really do wonder, you know, what the future for Logan is as uh, outside of just being a guy that might be in the press box for a little while. Yeah, a fair assessment, Huss. And you know, I wouldn't call this a referendum game for Logan Stanley. I mean, he's had plenty of opportunities. The coaching staff knows what he is, what he can be. Uh, but it is a, if he does it's a massive tonight, opportunity, he Huss. He can help and, himself in a big, big oh, way tonight. Absolutely, yes. Now, um, you know, how he plays, it's going to be tough. You know, you haven't been in the lineup for a while, but that's part of the job. If you're not in the lineup, you have to force your way into the lineup. Uh, it is a big opportunity, and you know that's not to say that Logan Stanley needs to find Keegan Colasar, who would be a willing combatant, but he does need to play an assertive game. And if you play a tentative game, Huss, you're right. I mean, this is not a, if you don't play this, you're on waivers, but your next opportunity um, may not be, you know, for a while. So... Uh, if if I'm Logan Stanley, I am definitely doing everything in my power to put my best foot forward. If you're if you're Declan Chisholm, Huss, and you feel like you outplayed Logan Stanley in the preseason, there's probably a part of you that that may think that in private. But 
it just has to be more fuel for him. Because obviously, Huss, what we're seeing in game four is that the Jets comp- have consider themselves in a competition for the number six job, which is where the team was at exactly one year ago. Uh, there just is one maybe unexpected person in that contest. Um, and he happens to be a highly paid player who is a popular teammate and and all of those things. So uh, the dynamic has changed, but Huss, I think there is a f- like legit open competition. If Rick Bonus is take, you know, Rick Bonus trusts his veteran players. We know this. If he's taking Nate Schmidt out after game three for Logan Stanley, the competition is on. So I yeah, think what it'll does be this say? I, I I wanted to ask you about what. Uh what this decision says about how Rick Bonus and the staff are feeling about Nate Schmidt's play so far this year and where his standing is on the team. Because, listen, he's getting a big check cut every week. And, um, you know, the 6D now being a healthy scratch in a game like this against his old team, I'll be honest, was a bit of an eye-opener when we were at the rink this morning. Oh, and and make no mistake, uh, this one will sting for Nate Schmidt. Uh, he has a deep affinity for that organization and 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 at the same time is probably quite ticked off about how it ended for him there. So uh, when you get scratched as a veteran player like Nate Schmidt, who just passed the 600 game mark, which is an incredible accomplishment for anyone who has ever played in the NHL, but especially for a college free agent, this would hit home and hit home hard for Nate Schmidt. Uh, but it, it's it's good that you have those feelings because it means that you care. If Nate Schmidt wasn't unhappy about being a healthy scratch against his former team, then there would be a real problem. Uh, but sure, I mean, what it says is that, uh, you know, we were wondering how Declan Chisholm or even Logan Stanley might get into a game. Well, we already have an early answer. That's not to say that it will be a revolving door and that Nate Schmidt is the only one under consideration to be a healthy scratch at times. But right now... Um, and also, too, I also wouldn't overreact a great deal, Huss, because let's not forget, and I'm not making excuses for him, but the facts are Nate Schmidt played in one preseason game, was involved in basically two practices, and then had a lower body injury. So he's playing catch up, uh, much like Nikolai Ehlers is up front. And I'm, I'm not putting their games on parallel tracks. What I am saying is that those guys are playing catch up where most of the other players have sort of got that portion of the season out of the way and are trying to find their groove. So, um, you know, this won't be the last that we see of Nate Schmidt and, you know, he's going to work his behind off to get himself back going. I mean, I talked with him at length the other day about what it meant to him to hit that 600 game mark. And like, if anyone thinks that Nate Schmidt's just going to quietly go away, uh, you know, like a mouse, they don't know Nate Schmidt's story has long before he got to Winnipeg when he was in Washington. This is a guy who thought he had won a job and saw the Capitals trade for a defenseman at consecutive trade deadlines that made him a healthy scratch. He still found a way to surpass the 600 game mark. Uh, is Nate Schmidt playing the way that he did when he was with Vegas? No, he's not, but he's also trying to get himself back to where he can be a you know, contributor on the regular for the Jets because he's a proud guy. He's been in the NHL for a long time. And nobody would be more disappointed than not playing up to his own standard than Nate Schmidt. So, like, I get it. People want to pile on uh, and all those things. And, and hey, that that's, that's part of fandom. I get it. But uh, I would just caution to say that, you know, Nate's washed and whatever else and you think he's going to be a healthy scratch the rest of the year. That That's not what the case is here. Uh, Jets saw an opening to try to give someone another chance, and they are doing that today. And now we'll see how things shake down over the next couple weeks here. Hey, by the way, great to see everyone out here. We've got 425 in chat. It's, uh, get those thumbs up going here, folks. Uh, let's try and get to 200. We would greatly appreciate it. As I always say, it's literally the easiest thing something can do. <laughs> hit, hit the thumbs up. And if you haven't already subscribed to the channel, join the 10,000-plus WSTers that have already done that. Um yeah, I, I mean, Nate's situation is complicated in that, um, you know, I think that where his game is at right now, he's on the periphery of the lineup. And I think, you know, from speaking with people, you know, within the Jets, the way things were going with Rick Bonus, he probably wasn't going to be in that opening game um, if Billy Hanel was hurt. But with that comes an opportunity. He has it, and now Logan Stanley has it. And I, I think it's a huge chance for Stan to... Um, and again, fans will say what, what, whatever, you know, some people, you know, still have a lot of faith in him. Others don't. 
but this is about showing up and you know having one of his strongest games playing with a physical edge which hasn't been there enough and uh, no team do you need that more than against the Vegas Golden Knights so let's rewind to where we started Appleton going up and yeah as you mentioned I mean, he kind of knows the assignment um, and to me, he's got to be, I called said earlier, he's got to be a dog out there. He's got to be running around. He's got to be on pucks. He's got to be forechecking fiercely. He's got to play with the speed in the game that you need to have to keep up with Kyle Connor and Mark Shifley. Yep. But his job is, it's almost a more simplified of Gabriel Velarde because I think Velarde brings a lot more offensively to that line than Appleton does. This is very simple. Um, tenacious forechecking, play well in your own end, and get the puck to 81 and 55 and let them do their thing. And I'm with you, Ken. Like, you know, would he have been the first guy that I put up there? Probably not. But the thing that I am most excited to see tonight, and you kind of outlined this, is the Lowry line with Nino Niederreiter and Alex Iafalo. We talked about this with Brandon Rowicki. I mean, I'm scratching my head trying to think of a time where Adam Lowry was surrounded by two more talented 200 foot players than those guys. Nito Niederreiter scores 20 in his sleep, although, man, he's been snake bit so far this year. Alex Iafalo has been an impact player in both ends so far, has looked good on that top power play. And Adam Lowry has brought his game kind of from the end of last season into the start of this season. Like, I wouldn't be surprised if those guys are pushing Connor and Shifley for ice time by the end of the game, depending on what happens with penalties, of course, just speaking to five on five. And, th- and a team like Vegas is exactly the sort of team that you'd like to have some company for Adam Lowry on a line that I think Rick Bonus is going to lean on early and often tonight for a full 60. Yeah, and here's the thing, Huss. I mean, that line played a ton the other night, but, I mean, they were probably the Jets' best line, right? I mean, people are saying, oh, why is the checking line out there uh, chasing the game? Well, <laughs> tell me what line was playing better. I mean, the Perfetti line didn't have anything going. That That's why the Lowry line was on the ice, and... Yeah, I agree with you. I mean, this is a, you know, this is a, this has the potential to be a great line, but Huss, that line is also going to have its hands full tonight because they will either be playing against Jack Eichel or Chandler Stevenson. So uh, depending on how that matchup game rolls along, but uh, when we talk about, you know, Velarde's injury and its impact, the third line needs to score. Like you can't just check, right? That line's got to also produce. Uh, right now, the top line's got to find a way to produce without Velarde because he's going to be on the shelf for an extended period of time. Now, let's not kid ourselves. Uh, the sprained MCL is the best case scenario for a foot and leg that twisted at an angle that it's not supposed to twist. Uh, and I think that some folks were scared that that might have been a season ender for Gabriel oh, Velarde. I've, never, that, that been, I've never been so relieved in my life to hear a star and important player is out for four to six weeks. Oh, it I was mean, crazy. Just, with, with all the other doom and gloom around that building in that game, that, uh, listen, that, that changed the game in a lot of ways too because, I mean, I thought the Jets had a great start. When Velarde went down, you're changing everything on the fly. Nothing was really clicking, and L.A. found their game and really did it. But, um, I mean, yeah, to your point, I mean, that was, I think, a bullet dodged. Um, but at the same time, I mean, they got to figure out a way to do it without Velarde, who had been such a great compliment to Shifley and Connor for the first seven periods of the season. Yeah, and the big difference now, Huss, and you know, it's taken me a while to get around to the Gus bus here, but I mean, the fact that the Jets are now going to insert David Gustafson instead of having to call someone up from the minors, who, you know, they had a f- bunch of guys that came up and played played hard last year and did a nice job, but you know, Gustafson coming off a preseason where he had three goals. You know, should be able to you know fit in seamlessly on that fourth line with Rasmus Kapari and Morgan Barron, who you know Morgan Barron had some great chances the other day as well. But I said, no, you're watching closely in the third line. I- I'm going to be staring at the second line because the second line needs to be better. Big uh, it time. hasn't. It hasn't been. You know, yes, Niederreiter had some really good chances, uh, absolute robbery in a couple of those games. But uh, even uh, even Ehlers himself has had the best chance of probably had the best chance of the first period on the doorstep, flicked it over. Like it almost was one of those things where he had too much time to think about it. And then instead of burying it, you know, top cheddar, he flicked it over the net and looked skyward, right? It was field goal. I'm not even sure it was a field goal. That might've been a Scott Norwood special, a wide, right? Uh, (laughs) Sorry, sorry to the folks in Buffalo who we, we know and love. Um, But yeah, I mean, so here's the thing. Ehlers is flying out there at times. He's skating really well. 
Uh, I know some people are down, you know, already pounding on the ice time, ice time, ice time. Well, Nikola Ehlers is getting himself going. He is playing catch up. I think his legs are there. Uh, there have been times where the plays have been there, but his hands are not at a game four or five level uh, because he missed so much time in the preseason. Now, I expect him to come around very quickly and start to dominate quickly. But right now, Nikolai Ehlers hasn't earned 20 minutes of ice time uh, in a game. Now, I think that that's going to change quickly, and the Jets are going to need him and Vladislav Nemestikov and Cole Perfetti to click tonight because they're going to have a tough matchup no matter who they're up against. Right? The other day we were talking about maybe Perfetti might be able to get a favorable matchup against the Kings. Well, that's not the case today. They're, they're going to be in tough, but that means dictate the pace of play with Nikolai Ehlers, Vladislav Nemestikov. And for all the folks just pointing at the computer printouts, like Vladislav Nemestikov has a high-end hockey IQ. Same with Cole Perfetti. And those guys, I think, can fit well with the East-West explosive style of Nikolai Ehlers. And for all the folks saying, oh, how can you abandon Perfetti after three games at center? It's not an official end to the experiment. This is a short-term fix. It will allow some insulation for Cole Perfetti. And then let's see what happens. They may revisit it at some point, uh, you know, probably not even that far down the road. But for the Jets to survive the stretch with Velarde out, they need guys like Nemestikov stepping up. They need the fourth line chipping in more, but they need their top six to continue to produce, and they need their second line to produce a little bit more. Well, and the thing is, the second line hasn't been really producing. They've had a few right. chances, and Nino has been a little snake bit through the first three games, but I don't think we could say that about Ehlers. Here's my question for you, Ken. With that move of Perfetti, and I agree with you. I mean, I think that if there was a game to do it, this is probably it, um, but... The decision to move Nemetsnikov into the middle of that line, how much is it to do with Perfetti and how much is it to do with getting Nikolai Ehlers going in your mind? Yeah, I'm not sure. I mean, I think they're they're intertwined to a degree, but I also think this is as way more to do with taking responsibility off the plate of, of Perfetti than saying you can't play center at this level ever. We're stopping this experiment right now. It's more about having a little bit more experience. And us, like just the quick rewind on this. A game against the Kings was going to be tough on Cole Perfetti. He's 21 years old, and he is an undersized center playing against a team that has Kopitar, Deneau, and Dubois down the middle. And it doesn't get any easier with Vegas. Vegas has the four deepest, cent, you know, the deepest four center group probably in the NHL. Uh, you know, maybe not in terms of not as much high end talent, but Eichel and Stevenson are producing at a great rate, and so is Carlson. And, oh, by the way, Nick Waugh would be playing up the lineup on almost every team. Oh, but by the way, Vegas has the best fourth line in hockey. So it's way less about Cole Perfetti can't do it than letting Cole Perfetti get his feet. Let's not forget, Cole Perfetti barely played hockey since last February. So they put a lot on his plate, a lot of responsibility. They're not saying he can't handle it, but what they're saying is, how about we take a little bit off your plate? Why don't you get your legs underneath you, get your offensive game flowing? His assist that he had, Huss, is about as an elite high-end vision that we've seen in 13 years of this hockey club, him finding Dylan DeMello in the high slot. I thought he was looking for Ehlers personally from the press box. Next thing you do, you look behind him, and there's Dylan DeMello going top cheese. So um, it's not that Cole Perfetti isn't doing anything and people are all over him. Oh, he's got to do this and he's got to do that. Hey, it's a guy who has barely played in the NHL. He's finding his way. There were always going to be hiccups or roadblocks or bumps, speed bumps. Let's use that instead of roadblocks. He's got to power his way through. And I think he'll be back at center before the year is over. But right now this is a situation it's not punishment to Cole Perfetti it's taking a little bit off his plate so that he can get back to doing the things that he does best Nemestikov is a guy that is quite frankly probably better down low he's bigger and stronger he's faster all those things just lightening the load for one player but the other thing Ehlers getting back on the right wing he's a guy who loves to play on the right side I mean it does expose him to some big hits at times when he's on his offside, but 
You got a left-handed center. And that's the other part too, which, you know, Perfetti was playing with Niederreiter on the right and not Ehlers. So maybe if they had gone the other way, maybe their chemistry would have been showing a little bit more early on as well. But I do think that those, that trio can play well together. And if they don't, they've got other options. That's the biggest thing right now for the Jets. The fact that one of their options for the top line job, you know, yes, we get it. He was a placeholder yesterday. But the fact that Rasmus Kapari is an option to go up and play on that top line because of his speed uh, and you know tenacity tells you that the Jets are trying in some ways to model their game after Vegas to a degree where you have four lines that you can lean on in all situations. And if other guys aren't going, Morgan Barron could get a bump up, you know? So those are all good things for the Jets to have. But the facts are, after the first period, Huss, they didn't generate almost any offense. And, you know, the fact that, you know, Mark Scheifele got a garbage goal to break up the shutout, well, you know, good for him. But that was, they didn't generate anything the Kings got them in the Python grip and it was basically game over for them for the way that that second half went. And for Perfetti too, like I hated that hit from behind us. So we've talked about this a ton. Yeah. I don't like the fact that the NHL isn't more stringent on hits from behind and boarding. And I would have said the same thing if it was Pierre-Luc Dubois getting face planted. That needs to be penalized. And the fact that that became an, in, like, are you kidding me? An instigator penalty for that? Like, oh, the, man. that's even full, get me going. full wake up territory, Huss. And it's a hard yeah. job. I, I'm not here to be. If Perfetti raped. doesn't get up in that situation, they call it. Like, it's almost like if the guy's not hurt, they consider, oh, maybe it was his own fault. So, and I mean, listen, the follow to that was a disaster for the Winnipeg Jets as well. Ken Harkins on waivers today. Yeah. If he clears, do you expect him to be back in the organization with the Moose? Uh, fair question, Hasse. I, I would say I wouldn't rule it out completely, but I would say I would be leaning to the no territory. Really? And I would just put it this way: um, even with the even with the Villard, the Villardi injury could change that uh, navigation of that element. But Hus, I, I, because Harkins is on a one-way contract, if you're not going to put him directly into the NHL. Um, I don't think the Jets want to be paying Jansen Harkins to be a, a million dollar insurance policy in the American League with the Manitoba Moose. Uh, that's to take nothing away from what he did as a member of the Moose last year. Um, but I, I don't think it's maybe top of mind for them right now just because of the two the one way nature of the contract. Now, you know, is it possible? Of course it is. And would it be possible that he could be the guy claimed and be the 13th forward or maybe compete with David Gustafson? Sure. Uh, what we also know, Huss, I mean, at the time of the initial waiver claim, there was believed to be some other interest uh, around the league. You know, Detroit is off to a nice start. Maybe maybe that, in, maybe there could be some interest that had cooled. Uh, but I think there could be a claim elsewhere uh, that sort of makes it a moot point, Huss. But if there isn't, I mean, it'll be very interesting to see. I mean, it's a it's a second round pick uh, of the organization, so it's a free free re- like do not pass go to not do not collect two hundred dollars. It's a free depth player to go back into the organization. Uh, but I think yeah. that your point about the one way deal, I think, is uh, is well taken. And listen, the start. I mean, for anyone that was paying attention to the moose start on the weekend, um, you know, the fact that Hark isn't there. It's allowing the Lamberts yep. and the Lucius's and the Chibrikovs a chance to play up in the lineup, and that probably in the long term is better for it. One more for you, speaking of the Moose. Yep. Gus is going in right now. They have no extra forwards. Who, uh, If you had to lay a, a, a nickel down on who the first call-up would be from the Moose, I mean, we saw Parker Ford sort of open some eyes, and he was one of the last guys sent down. Um, who do you think, and I, I guess, I mean, Granted, depending on what hole they're trying to fill, that might, you know, maybe it'd be a Toninato, maybe it would be. But how do you see that happening if they do need to go to the Moose as to who would be at the top of that list? Yeah, I mean, Hustle, you know, for a road game, they're they're probably going to t- put someone on the plane on Friday like, when they go to Edmonton, right? I mean, this is just the way that the NHL teams work. So um, I would say the the... the cool bet lines for me would be Toninato 1 and maybe... I would say Ford is a possibility. 
but I think Tony and and also I mean Axel Janssen Fialbi would be a potential guy there as well uh, in that thirteenth forward role. Uh, yeah, I get it. Brad Lambert had a nice start to the weekend. I think two goals and an assist, and good for him. But Hus, the last thing that the Jets want to do is have Brad Lambert on the yo on the yo yo for me. Brad Lambert needs to go down, dominate for an extended period of time, and you know what? In between that domination there will be hiccups <laughs> just by nature of him being a young player learning at the pro level. Uh, great for him to produce and important for him to produce for an extended period of time uh, before he gets an early call up. Um, that's not to say that I don't, I, I think that Brad Lambert will make his NHL debut before the season is over, but I don't think mentally you want to put those players on the, you know, the up and down express Well, and where they're going into the lineup too. I mean, like, exactly. let's face it, this is probably, you're going in to play alongside Gustafson and maybe Morgan Barron. If that was the case, I'd assume that Kapari would be moving up in the lineup. Yeah. And then, you know, do one of the guys, those guys really fit doing a fourth line, playing a very different role and style that they're playing right now. No, probably mm-hmm. not. Um, so, you know what, an Axel, I think might be like, I think they love having Toninato down there being a real leader and being a difference maker for the Manitoba Moose and being a guy that can help the young players. Yep. Um, and Axel, when we think about, you know, what he done, you know, certainly when you talk about roles in the fourth line, the PK, uh, aspect of his game, his speed, I think probably would make him. I think if I had to lean one way or the other, I think he'd probably be the guy that might be at the top of the list now, just thinking it out out loud while we're having this combo. Yeah, and I mean, for Parker Ford, it's if you're thinking about inserting someone in the lineup that brings a little bit more jam and energy, then I think Parker Ford would probably be at the top of the list. But he is not going, you know, I don't think Gustafson has such a short leash that if things don't go incredibly well that they would be considering a change for Saturday night at Edmonton. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think it's probably between Tony Notto and Janssen Fialbi. And, yeah, as you mentioned, I mean, Tony Notto, I think, is named as one of the alternate captains uh, earlier this week. So, uh, but th- that's not to say that they wouldn't lean on him, you know, for the weekend or whatever else. But, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's an interesting time. And that's why Rick Bonus said when they sent these guys down, well, you're going to see this player. You're going to see that player. You're going to see this player. The other thing for Ford Huss, uh, he's not as young as a Lambert or a Lucius, but he's still getting just to know the professional game. So I, I think there's also benefit for Parker Ford, you know, getting a half season or whatever the number is under his belt at the American League level uh, before he gets a taste of the NHL. But Huss, Rick Bonus said this, and all coaches say this if, if you leave an impression in training camp, there's always going to be a chance that you are the first option because you had the best camp. Now, having said that, you can make the argument that Declan Chisholm had a better camp than Logan Stanley, but Stanley went in first probably because of familiarity and and you know size, all the all the things that Rick Bonus talked about today. But yeah, I mean, it, it's it's super interesting that in Game Four <laughs> we're talking about response games and all of these other things, but it's pertinent. Because the Jets looked really good in Calgary, Huss, and didn't win. They looked really good for the majority of the Florida game and did win. And all of a sudden, you had one great period against LA and and two kind of stinkers, for lack of a better term. So you don't really know what you're going to be getting, but that's what the Jets' goal has to be, to look the same. Like they were all the things we talked about after that game against Florida – it's hard to look the same against Vegas because they can impose their will on you. And, you know, Saturday in Edmonton, well, after a tough start against Vancouver, you know, Edmonton found its game in the second game, even though they got goalied uh, by Casey DeSmith. Well, they look back to being themselves. So there's not a lot of let up on the NHL schedule. And we knew that it was going to be a tough schedule for the Jets out of the gate. But if you want to be a playoff team, you got to play well against playoff teams and no better measuring stick in the early going than to face the Stanley Cup champions. Kenny, just before we go, um, obviously, uh, you know, I mentioned this off the top of yesterday's show, kind of focusing more on the game, but um, just quickly, any uh, any thoughts about all the empty seats right now and the predicament that uh, the organization finds himself in early this season? Yeah, Huss, I mean, it, it's interesting. And, you know, I, I don't pretend to tell people how they should spend their money. And, you know, we go to sporting events in other towns. Uh, I get it. I mean, that's what people do. If you love sports, you go to sporting events. Um, right now, there needs to be, you know, it's a two-way street. And I think that uh, we need to get to the point where, 
you know, it'll be it, it's a it's a tough thing to see Hus for sure. Uh, and I know that anyone who grew up in the 90s in this province uh, has, you know, it's, it's natural if you see empty seats, some people will jump to conclusions. Uh, but at the same time, I think people also need to recognize that it's a, you know, it's a real thing. Uh, no team can, you know, no team can uh, be economically thriving if there are 4,000 seats in a gate-driven league. Now, that's not to say that the moving trucks are, are moving in here uh, right now, but... Uh, at the same time, I think that, you know, there are things that True North needs to do and there are things that the fan base and the business community will need to do eventually. And there's going to have to be f- common ground um, in order for this to continue to be an NHL market. Um, and again, I don't mean that to sound dire, but um, yeah, I mean, whether you like the tone or not, like NHL teams can't survive with, you know, 10,000 people in the, in the stands, right? I mean, we remember, you know, it's 12 years ago, but Gary Bettman was here and, um, you know, you need somewhere in the neighborhood of 13,000, but you know, the, the goalposts are moving. It's been a tough time uh, with COVID and everything else. Us, there are a lot of factors that have gone in uh, to this scenario. Uh, but what I would say is that there needs to be a solution and and both, both of those sides, fan base and, and true North, and the business community, those three sectors need to find some some space where they listen uh, to each other, uh, air some things out. And I think that what we've seen, we've seen the Jets invest in the building. Um, Hus, you know, I'm not on the concourse the way that you are for a game, but I know that when I walk towards the elevator to get upstairs, I envision there being a much, much less crowded experience than you've had before. Um, but at the same time, I mean, a lot of these things are intertwined and Hassan, uh, this to me, I said this to you a long time ago, uh, like in the years ago, uh, if there's, there's only 11,000 and change for a team that just committed 119 million to two homegrown players. Uh, I, I think for all the people saying that there would have, you know, they should have just rebuilt and burned it to the studs. I'm sorry. Like if you're only getting 11,000 for a competitive team, um, you're not going to be able to survive in this market. I, I don't think that the Jets could ever have gone to the point where, like, it could have been in the 8,000s and things. It's easy to say in the rebuild, I support a rebuild. Well, no, if you're not supporting with the pocketbook, I just don't think the Jets were, could have taken that risk. And, you know, the building, it, it's more fun when the building's full, but they got to find a way to fill the building. And, the, you know, there's got to be, It's it's a, this is not a one-way street. This is a... Um, this is a 3D street, Huss, for lack of a better term here. And I think that, you know, the sooner that those parties, uh, you know, I'm sure there's conversations being held and feedback cool. coming. And uh, there's a lot of people airing out feedback in inboxes. So, yeah. uh, and, yeah, and I and, don't, and, and Huss, you work in that building. There's no way that True North is is ignoring uh, what they see. And uh, I would expect that, you know, no, that was, uh, that was a major reality check, I think, for uh, whether you're in the True North office, whether you are a fan, whether you are uh, a business person in the city that, you know, benefits from having a National Hockey League team. I mean, there's uh, there's just so much to it. And again, I mean, I know there are some people that, um, I mean, listen, I guess there's blame to go around. And I mean, we've talked about it before on this program, some of the missteps that the organization has had. Um, bottom line right now is to, as you mentioned, um, you know, open lines of communication, accept what's happened in the past, improve it, move forward, and um, hopefully get to a much better place where this team is on a better foot going forward uh, for this season and seasons to come. Weber, we'll see you at the rink tonight. Thanks for uh, your contributions as always, and uh, we'll look forward to seeing what you and Rennie have cooking uh, tonight after the game. My pleasure, Huss. Thanks for having me, and uh, keep the joy level high. You got it right on. There's Ken Weeb. Check out Kenny and Rennie tonight after the game. You know where to find them on YouTube at the K&R channel. All right. Coming up, we, uh, you know, before the end of the show, we had a quick little chat in the room with Rasmus Kapari. We'll play that for you. Uh, but coming up, our old pal Gary Lawless. I did get a chance to go for dinner with he and his broadcast partner last night. It was great to kind of catch up. But, um, you know, wanted to talk a little bit about the Vegas Golden Knights, their summer, what it was like, you know, with the cup the whole time, what he's been up to. And uh, as always, Gary wanted to get into some bomber talk as well. So we will do that. And, of course, whenever we talk bombers on WST, we do it for our great partners at Princess Auto. 4 p.m., 
The party gets started outside IG Field before the Bomber game on Saturday. Uh, three fifty hot dogs and pop, five dollar beers. Uh, hopefully this weather stands up for everybody, but it should be another great crowd, another great game, and the Bombers can officially clinch their spot in the West Final with a win. Princess Auto, of course, is where you'll find the best deals and the most unique assortment of tools and equipment around. Everything you need to complete the projects on your list or start something new is at Princess Auto. Pop by and see them on Panet Road or Portage Avenue West, and you can always shop online 24-7, 365 at princessauto.com. Um, Joe out of Consolidated Supply has got a, probably a little bit of extra time unanticipated to uh, be working the irrigation scene right now. Of course, Consolidated Supply has so many uh, aspects of their business that can uh, benefit you, your property, or your business. They are the leaders in irrigation systems, artificial turf, both indoor and outdoor, and of course, golf carts and other vehicles from Club Cars, the exclusive dealer in Manitoba. What you might not know is they've got other great options for your property, including hot tubs, which uh, might come in handy this winter, and amazing outdoor kitchens as well. And they are the local leaders in small engine parts and repair. So much consolidated supply has going on. Pop by and see them at their showroom, open to the public. They're at 1395 Niaqua Road East, or you can find out more by checking them out online at cte.ca. Uh, if you are heading to the game tonight, or the Bomber game on Saturday, you're probably going to want to make a stop at Royal Sports to make sure you've updated your gear, supporting the home teams at the various venues. Uh, when it comes to Bombers, there is so much cool Bomber stuff at Royal Sports, including many exclusives that you won't find anywhere else. And the same goes for the biggest selection of Jets merchandise you'll find out on the rack and in the aisles at Royal Sports. Uh, all the jerseys out there, customized as you like it. Maybe you want one of those new players. I know there's a few Rasmus Kapari fans that are thinking about getting a 15. Royal Sports has you covered there. Also, your favorite NFL teams represented, World Soccer and more. Not to mention, with hockey season here, you probably already know, but for 40 years, family-owned with hockey players working in the department, Royal Sports is the premier hockey superstore in town for players of all ages and all skill levels. Get down to Royal Sports, 750 Pembina Highway. Give them a follow on Instagram, at Royal Sports Pembina. And uh, listen, I'd love to see everybody at the game tonight, but if you're not at the game, and you, of course, want to watch the Winnipeg Jets, but a lot of other, tons of hockey tonight, we'll get to them in the cool bet lines. Both the ALCS and the NLCS going today, and, well, kind of a dud of a Thursday nighter between the Jags and the, and the Saints. But your fantasy teams, your bets, you'll probably be up paying attention to that as well. Listen, when it comes to going out, the premier sports bar in Winnipeg is your local Boston pizza. Chow down great new bits on the uh, appetizer menu that uh, we tried out on Monday night at Monday Night Football down at BP Taylor. Uh, ice cold schooners, world famous Boston wings, and gourmet pizzas and more. Pop by today for Boston, for, uh, you know, get together with your gang at Boston Pizza. And don't forget, if you are staying in, you can always order online at bostonpizza.com. All right, we'll catch up with Rasmus Kapari for a few minutes before the end of the show. We'll hit the cool bet lines. But earlier today, down at the rink, got a chance to catch up with my old running partner, Gary Lawless, who's in town with the Vegas Golden Knights to uh, talk about the, the, the summer for the Knights, celebrating the Cup Championship the 4-0 start, and of course, a little Bomber and CFL talk as well with the Lawman. Well, look who's here. The Vegas Golden Knights Stanley Cup champs are back, and so is our pal Gary Lawless. How are you? Give the people what they want. <laughs> Zoltan, this is for you, baby. <laughs> yeah. Hustler and I were having a beer this summer. Uh, one time we got to get together for a little visit, and... Uh, you still have some fans around this city. Gentleman approached us <laughs> and said, I want a one-hour <laughs> H&L special. On Winnipeg Sports Talk. You're not getting an hour, but we'll uh, we'll see how long we can chop it up for. No doubt. Uh, hey, this is going to be an interesting game tonight. Obviously, these two teams saw each other in the playoffs, and uh, it uh, certainly ended up all Vegas, as did the rest of the playoffs. First off, how uh, what was the summer like? Um, <laughs> I can't imagine there's anything like being Stanley Cup champs, creating that trophy around. Uh, I'm sure for you and everyone in the organization, it was uh, one to remember. It was fun. It, it's a lot of work. We call them champagne problems. When you win, <laughs> you, you like seriously, like our our content team, which I'm a part of, 
they went to all these cup parties. They try. I didn't have to do that. We, we, my part of the department, we wrote a book, uh, and it came out very nicely. So, but that was. I got to Manitoba on June 23rd and went to the lake and sat there and wrote for a month and then uh, sequestered yourself in I Castle Lawless, Castle Spain. Lawless, yeah, uh, 800 square feet of uh, of uh, shack on it's the shore. It's a beautiful of, spot. It's a good spot and no complaints. Lucky to have it. Um, that actually turned out quite well. I mean, I, I've seen, you know, on social media, the, the the book and the package itself. There's a lot more that goes into it than just writing the thing, I guess. Yeah, no, I like I'm one part of the... Uh, the words are mine and my colleague Gordon Weigers. Uh, I wrote the chapters and he wrote uh, the, some really cool sidebars, like like you know the the card game on the plane and who sits where on the dressing room. He did some really cool stuff, uh, and, but the pictures are unbelievable. And yeah, it was just it was really fun. And we are at our uh, we had our cup party. The broadcasters we got the cup for eight hours last Wednesday night. So chain ninety and uh, what did you drink out of it? I didn't drink it. Uh, I didn't drink anything out of it that day. I, out of I, your five hundred dollar bottles of wine, no, some of that. No, I won the back sell. I was hosting. I was running around trying to make sure uh, everybody had a good time. I'll be honest. My uh, cup moment during this the, during our Stanley Cup parade in Vegas. After the game, after Vegas won, I was on the ice with a with a headset for the broadcast doing interviews. And by the time they said, "Okay, Gary, we're going to sign off." Mark Stoll was taking the cup off the ice and in the dressing room. So I never touched it. Everybody else got to lift it on the ice. Well, I never got to. And But during the parade, I was on a float with Keegan Colasar and Zach Whitecloud. And I, you know, I've known those. I've known Keegan since he was... The Manitoba Mafia on the since, float. I've known him since he was like six. And Zach I've known for a long time too. They knew that I didn't get to, to lift the cup. So they brought... They had the... The cup brought on the float. I was on a float with them, their families, and my family. So my wife and daughter, right beside me, they brought the cup to me, and they were screaming. They were so <laughs> everyone was so happy, right? But they're screaming, and and then like two other players, Will Carrier, Carrier, and Nick Waugh, they've got bottles of champagne. They're waiting, and they're going, "Come on, Gary!" <laughs> so I got to I got to lift it up, and they soaked me with champagne. And as I was lifting it up. I looked at my daughter, and I had my hand on the bottom and on the and on the neck of the cup. I said, "Put your hand on the bowl." So as I lifted it up, my little girl got. To, so we've got, I've got a we've got a picture, and it's uh, so that's that's my that was great. my little bowl. All right, yeah. enough about Vegas winning the Stanley Cup. We're in a new yeah, season. We're into a new season right now. No one is Stanley Cup <laughs> champions what, right now. We're you defending, hold on. defending Stanley Cup Gold champions. Of the champs. Uh, that being said, a great start though, four and zero. And yeah. listen, you know, sometimes when you have that short uh, off season, um, listen, there's a lot of continuity in this team, and I get why they brought everybody back for the most part. Yeah. Um, but what uh, the early start of the season? I mean, this looks like the team that. Uh, Frankly, we saw doing it last uh, last spring. Yeah, they since the All Star break last year, they went twenty two four and five down the stretch. Edmonton, Dallas, Colorado, L.A. all like nipping at their heels. They held them off sixteen and six in the Stanley Cup playoffs, and now four and zero to start. They have done a ton of winning, and you know it's easy to say, "Oh, bring them all back." No one gets to bring them all back in the salary cap era. Kelly McCrimmon did a, has done a fantastic job with the cap. It, people a couple of years ago were like, "Oh, they're they're they got to play 15 guys." Well, they added Mark Stone, Jack Eichel, and Alex Petrangelo. Ten million, nine and a half, nine. Like they added a ton of money in a short amount of time because they didn't have the luxury of having a. They went to the Stanley Cup in the first year and they couldn't turn their back on that. Couldn't say, "Oh, we're going to be draft and develop now." And trade everybody. They, they had the, they, they they had something special, so they added to it. So there was a little window where, you know, that times were a little tight. But now they 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 got space, and they're gonna have space going forward. They get they're they are the the like they're like the twenty first oldest team in the NHL. They're not old. Like the like they've got you know, Martinez and Petrangelo. Uh, are are well into their 30s, but who else is in that like 25 to 30 
window. They could be around for a while. The one, uh, the one off-season move um, that was made that probably was another tough one to do was moving Riley Smith. It's the hardest trade in Golden Knights history. Yeah, um, without question. I mean, he's been, you know, an, uh, an original. Uh, War a letter. Fit. War a letter the whole time he was in Vegas. He started a, a charity in Vegas. It's you would love it. They play a softball game. The Golden Knights versus the Raiders. We call it uh, the battle for, for the Golden Knights by a million in that one. They win every year. <laughs> they call it the, ba the battle for Vegas. Uh, yeah, all these farm boys from Saskatchewan <laughs> and Manitoba all know how to play Big baseball. Pitch guys. Yeah. But the reason I bring that up is that he's he, uh, millions of dollars for 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 uh, and for distressed communities in Vegas. You know, and uh, and now obviously with Pittsburgh, but a big part of that was uh, Barbashev. Yeah. Barbashev seemed to be such a perfect fit at the deadline. Um, he seemingly uh, has uh, found a new home. He's got a ring for it, but I mean, a big part of this team, and it's the, the in some ways it seemed like the one missing piece, both at the deadline and not, now a big part of this club. Barbashev at eight mil. They had to, they, they had to, they needed the money to retain those yeah. to retain those two guys. When Barbashev was that, the, you know, he of all the players acquired at the deadline. They had more points than anybody else. And like Tarasenko, Kane, all these other high-end games that got moved. Uh, Bertuzzi, et cetera, all these guys. He had more points than any of them in the in the playoffs. Uh, his team went all the way, but that's that's part of it. So uh, he's been tremendous. Well, um, you know, just before we get to this, this one tonight, um, coming off a win against Dallas, and you know what's funny? I was kind of looking at you know some of the betting lines, and I'm like, how in the world is Dallas a road favorite? In Vegas, um, they have actually had uh, yeah Ottinger. He's never lost to the Golden Knights in regular season. That was a hell of a game. We saw some of that at the end of uh, in the one. I mean, there uh, there's been four. The uh, Vegas has played four games. They've had four fights. Kolasar fought twice. Nick Head went after Jamie Benn for his uh, for what he did to Mark Stone in uh, in the Western Conference Final. And then uh, there was a high check on Brett Howden. Like there's so many Manitoba connections, it's crazy. I checked on uh, on Brett Howden and uh, Ben Hutton zoomed in and grabbed me some Marshman and they fought. So uh, and it was the, the Dallas led late, two one. And Bruce Cassidy, it's so fun to watch him coach. He decides, you know, what do I need to do in a game? And he adjusts. So he William Carlson was going. He put Carlson with Stone and Stevenson. Sure enough, Carlson with a tip, high tip out front. Tied it at two, and then uh, Marsha so with the winner in the shootout. It's been fun to watch. Well, uh, it should be a fun one tonight. Uh, it's Cup champs in town, Vegas and the Jets, seven o'clock p.m. I got three. Blue Bomber great to see you. Yeah, is, is there a win? Is it like? Is uh, you, want, you want to talk Blue Bomber right now? Sure. You're going to get uh, absolutely. Let's go. Yeah. Well, I think that O'Shea has done a really good job getting them to this point, and now they just had a buy. And if you, if they, if the, if BC loses on Friday night, they can take care of them themselves on Saturday at IG Field. Yeah. But well, but maybe not. BC loses, you got to rest people. You got to, you know, you have very little small dose of Claros and some of those those uh, I older think that guys. Those guys are going to play. I think more. This is going to be the last time you see the Bombers together fully before because i think that that game in calgary becomes that time because again you've got another bite you're gonna sit andrew, guys for andrew, a month andrew you can, you, can, you can play them a little bit yeah he's got to make sure claros is healthy and those big guys on the offensive line that's the that's the the, the offensive line and the defensive line they're old in those spots if he can give them as much rest as possible in the next little while i i i, I sent o'shea a text i'm gonna tell a tale at a school I sent him a text. I was watching the games that I actually went to a game this summer, and I sent him a text. I said, can I ask a candy question? And we're, we have a friendship now. It's not a business relationship anymore. He's like, of course. I said, are you too old along the line of scrimmage? He said, no. He said, I'd rather have veteran guys that know how to do it and what to do when, when the time comes. And if we can, if we can get there, and and be healthy and not tired. So it's important to to wrap it up this weekend so that you can mm -hmm. whatever you know. I hear what you're saying. You don't want to. Yeah, a month is a long, long time, and we've just seen them in this situation before, and they have not done that, especially when you Different build group, in the buy. This is a group that's been to three straight. Yeah. three straight. Put it this way: if you're they wrestling all the offensive linemen, you better not have number eight behind. Uh, there behind you go. It. Um, 
just quickly. Is, that, is Oliveira going to win the most outstanding player? Oh, well, I mean, is he going to win the most outstanding player on the Bombers? Some of, I, I read somewhere the other day. The good thing is I don't think any of the guys, guys care. Say, no, they don't care. Uh, someone said it's Calaris by a mile. I don't know. The guy in, the guy in, uh, in Toronto, Chad Kelly, has to get a little bit of a look, too, doesn't he? I mean, yeah, except for the fact that, I mean, you know, when they when he had a real opportunity to go and show it, they didn't play him huh, against yeah. the Bombers. So, and if you listen, the Argos, to the Argos scary? Quick thought. Um, that, that's a hell of a football team. Yeah. I mean, listen, they beat the Bombers in the, in the game last year, albeit very close. And I think you can safely say they're a much better team this year than they were last year. But as we saw, I mean, it all comes down to one game. Uh, and I think the Bombers... Uh, listen, I mean, the Bombers have a championship pedigree. They've won, but they've also lost. I think BC that scary? makes them more. Uh, they scare me a lot more playing at BC Place than they do in Winnipeg Absolutely. in the middle of November. Absolutely. I'll tell you that. Absolutely. That's why that game last week. Yeah. Uh, did you see that game? Bit of it. Uh, it uh, one of the best regular season games you've seen in the Canadian. Is old Shady? In a, uh, in a I, really I say he's time. the best coach of the country by a, and if by a, by a, a long shot. Oh, I don't think I don't think there's any question. Um, Listen, with all due respect to Dinwiddie, I mean, Dinwiddie's done a great job of the amount of time that he's here. And they won the championship I last year. I still can't year. forgive the Dinwiddie. <laughs> all, all I had to do was not throw those interceptions, and they would have beat the Riders. It was Riders. his first start. It doesn't it matter. Start. Speaking I mean, of the Riders, I'll tell you what. Just quick, let's finish on a positive note. You haven't mentioned Ryan Dinwiddie <laughs> to Brandon Tavin. Pour <laughs> down. Uh, Riders are in a situation. if they, They're nine-point underdogs at home. If they lose this game, Calgary just needs one win to make the playoffs, and it'll be two consecutive years the Riders do not win a game after Labor Day. Too bad. <laughs> it's a great way to end it. Great seeing you, man. Thanks for doing this. Thanks, buddy. Good to see you. And just like old times, now beat it. Ah. All right. <laughs> uh, always fun getting together with uh, with Gary. Uh, we had a great dinner last night at Ray and Jerry's. Hadn't been there in a long time. Still looks the same. Still great, gar uh, great grub. Uh, but anyways, great catching up with him and uh, – I do miss talking CFL with Gary. There's no doubt about that. And he's uh, still very keen on the Winnipeg Blue Bombers and still really tied in. All right. Uh, we do have cool bet lines coming up. we got a massive, massive night in the National Hockey League with 11 other games in addition to the 7 o'clock puck drop between the Knights and Jets down at Canada Life Center. Don't forget, if you are heading down to the game tonight or at any point this season, great news for fans of great beer because Little Brown Jug is now in the ar arena. If you're in the lower bowl, you can pick up both 1919 and generic lager at either the north end uh, uh, craft beer corner or the south end. And good news, this wasn't the case before, uh, but if you're a season ticket holder, that 25% discount for on, your, on beer also applies to the local beers as well. Uh, and if you're in the upper bowl, craft beer corner, section 310, the corner bar there is where you will get the great taste of Little Brown Jug. Of course, um, always great stuff kicking around at Little Brown Jug with new beers coming all the time. Those are the, the mainstays. Best place to try it out for yourself is the brewery and tap room down on William Avenue. And of course, you can find Little Brown Jug anywhere that sells great beer. Check them out online as well. They do have local delivery options at littlebrownjug.ca. And uh Hey, a shout out to Nick and Nikki DQ for their great support of Winnipeg Sports Talk. You know, they've got four locations for the DQs in Winnipeg. Uh, well, three in Winnipeg, DQ Northgate, DQ Polo Park, and the DQ St. Anne's. They've also got the DQ in Niverville. And I was seeing DQ Nick's Instagram story of him firing up delicious pitas at their new pita pit out in Niverville. Congratulations on that. If you are in the Niverville area, pop by their pita pit. Healthy, fast, delicious, fresh. And uh, they do great catering as well. Find out more on Twitter or X at Pita Pit Niverville if you want Nick and Nikki to uh, cater an event for you from the Pita Pit. Um, all right, we are going to uh, get into the cool bet lines in a minute. We got an NFL game tonight, two baseball games from the ALCS and the NLCS, and 12 games in the National Hockey League. But as part of going down to hook up with Gary this morning, um, we were able to time it. So I had a little bit of time to jump into the locker room before heading back for the lock shop and figured the one guy that we really hadn't spoken to or heard from was Rasmus Kapari, the uh, third member 
of the triumvirate coming over from the Los Angeles Kings. Really impressed with Rasmus's English and uh, got a chance to you know, talk to him about kind of getting settled with the Winnipeg Jets, his start to the season, and of course this big matchup tonight. Here's a quick chat with Rasmus Kapari from this morning down at Canada Life Centre. All right, we're here with Rasmus Kapari, the Winnipeg Jets. Rasmus, early in the season, uh, how are you uh, finding yourself um, easing into uh, being a Winnipeg Jet? How's it been so far through camp in the early part of the season? Uh, it's been really good so far. Uh, obviously, tough loss against LA, but I think there's been a lot of good things in our game. Uh, and I think this system style of play fits pretty well in my game. Uh, like we pressure a lot, uh, try to get pucks back that way, skating team, which is one of my biggest strengths, so I've liked it so far. You've made a real impression with the fan base and obviously with the coaches as well, getting an opportunity to move up in the lineup uh, last week, last game, unfortunately due to the uh, injury to Gabe. I mean, uh, how are you feeling about your role so far and uh, what you're capable of now within, within this Winnipeg Jet lineup? Uh, I'm trying to build my confidence up all the time, uh, step by step. There's been a lot of good things. Could have scored last game. Uh, I know it'll, it'll come at some point. Just gotta keep working hard. And uh, yeah, I know I know I got some uh, more offense in my game. What uh, maybe the last couple of years have shown. Uh, but obviously, the biggest thing is just work hard, stick with our structure, and uh, that'll that'll get us there. Uh, you've had a big part in the uh, success of the team so far this season. I have to ask you about just being traded. Uh, now are you feeling much more comfortable here in Winnipeg? And uh, just talk to us maybe about your excitement to be part of this team moving forward in your new home. Mm, yeah, super excited about this kind of, I would say, fresh start. Sometimes it's good and uh, it's part of this business. And uh, obviously, first trade, maybe a bit of a shock for the first couple of days. But uh, I took it well and... Uh, uh, just looking forward and super excited about this season and uh, I, I like this organization a lot. All the guys are nice, nice and uh, great dudes. So yeah, keep like looking forward to this season and uh, uh, I like it here a lot. Um, big one tonight against the Stanley Cup champs, of course, coming from the Kings in the Pacific Division. You know this team very well. What are you expecting tonight when you go up against the team that the Jets played against at the uh, in the playoffs last season? Mm, obviously, they're going to play hard. They got like pretty big decor there. That's what I remember from last year. Last couple of years, uh, a lot of skill in their lineup. Experienced. Uh, so we got to be ready, ready for tonight's game, and uh, it's a big test for us. Thanks a lot. Good luck tonight. Thank you. All right. Good stuff with Rasmus Kapari. Looking forward to seeing him back in the lineup tonight. And uh, again, he is not, at least to begin the game, moving up with Shifley and Connor. That was the case yesterday in practice. It's going to be Mason Appleton's spot to start the game tonight. Love the <laughs> love the comments in the chat from that one. It's your boy Bruce. Big J Huss. Yeah, Big J Huss was in full effect this morning. Got a question in the Appleton scrum. Little one-on-one -on -one with Kapari and Doug, Doug Phil. Huss is dominating his presence, interviewing Rasmus while standing. Reem, I didn't know whether that is the proper protocol. I know Edmonds was having a chat with Pionk. He's in there every day. He was sitting on the bench, but I, I, I didn't know whether that was proper protocol. Do I sit down on the bench and do it sort of even, or do I just pop in before he gets you know all of his equipment off and do it that way? I agree. I don't. I think we don't want to get chirped there, Huss. It's like stepping on the carpet. Like because you're not in the NHL, are you allowed to? Uh, are you allowed to sit on the bench beside him for the interview? Um, many unwritten rules. Yeah, there's just too many unwritten rules. So playing it safe. Uh, you know, he wanted to stay seated. You stand. I don't know if you had a permission to sit in someone. So what if someone came? and wanted to sit there that would have been awkward that would have been very awkward and that's another reason why i didn't uh why i didn't do that maybe mm -hmm. at some point if we can get there regularly enough we'll have the comfort level to actually sit down in the mm -hmm. stalls for those one-on-ones yeah a bit of a learning experience there and one thing has we should also mention when you go into the room you got to put this like plastic film on your shoes because they don't want your <laughs> dirt they don't want your dirt from your shoes or any rocks to get on the on the carpet and Let's just say, yeah, we both did, did that right away. No, no problems for us. <laughs> no, no, I did there. not forget. I did you, not you forget didn't to forget. do that and have to go out back and do that. It was not pointed out to me uh, if it did happen. Um, 
but yeah anyways fun uh fun morning down uh seeing gary getting into the room and uh hope you enjoyed the little chat we had with rasmus kapari all right before we go we got a huge huge night when it comes to sports um first off let's go to the majors i'm three and oh with the daily picks this week for cool bet we're trying to go four and oh tonight and i think i'm just going to keep on riding with the astros Got them at even money earlier today. They are now minus 104 for the game tonight. Um, big win last night to get back into the series. I think they keep rolling. I think this one goes to 2-2 tonight. So I am taking the Astros, who are now minus 104. Very close to a pick em. And uh, the Phillies, the home run kings of the playoffs, minus 122 in Arizona to take on the D-backs. We've got an NFL game tonight. And we've got a lock shop uh, partner parley in there on this one as well. Sounds like Trevor Lawrence is going to play. There is a pregame workout. Nathan Rourke has been moved up to the 53-man roster, so take that for what it's worth. Um, the Saints are two-and-a-half-point favorites. I do like New Orleans in this, in this spot. It's only their third home game of the year. Jags have played a lot. They've traveled a lot over the last little while. Um, but the one thing I do love is the under, 40-and-a-half was going through New Orleans uh, games so far this year. They haven't gone over 40 points in any game this season. You add in a depleted Trevor Lawrence, I think this one stays under as well. Um, and as far as the exclusives go, we've got the Lock Shop Partner Parlay for tonight's game. If you want to jump on it, it is at 8-1. to one. The under 40 and a half, Alvin Kamara, five plus receptions, five or more and Travis Etienne to get to 20 or more receiving yards. Uh, we've also got a three-gamer in the National Hockey League. Rangers to win in regulation. They're taking on Nashville. Buffalo over Calgary, money line, so they could win an OT or shootout as well. And the Kings to beat the Minnesota Wild. That one is plus 750. And we're riding with all the underdogs in the CFL this week. For our partner parlay, Stamps plus eight and a half, Riders plus nine and a half, Elks plus eleven and a half. That's up right now at plus six seventy five. As far as the games go, the NHL, we'll just run them down real quick. Calgary's a slight favorite in Buffalo. Calgary minus one twenty two. Sabers plus one hundred four. I like Buffalo. Playoff rematch. We've got one here tonight. We've also got one in Sunrise. Leafs minus 140 faves against the Panthers at plus 119. That Ranger game we mentioned, Rangers are a minus 187 money line favorite against the Preds. The Canucks, slight uh, underdogs, plus 105 in Tampa. Lightning minus 124. The Oilers are back to being big favorites after that ugly start. Minus 211 in Philly tonight. Uh, Kings and Wilds, just about to pick them. Wild, a very slight minus 111 favorite. Kings at minus 106. Pretty much the same line for the Coyotes and, Bru and Blues. Blues minus 111. Coyotes minus 105. The game we'll see tonight at Canada Life Center. Jets a slight home underdog, minus 103. Vegas minus 114. Dallas a monster fave against the Ducks, minus 249. Ducks plus 205 at home. The Canes <clears throat> in Seattle take on the Kraken. Carolina minus 139. Kraken plus 118, and uh, the Avalanche at home, a monster, minus 330 favorite against Bedard and the Blackhawks, and oh, we've actually got the Sharks and Bruins tonight as well. Boston minus 267, road favorites, and the Sharks plus 220. It's all there for you at Cool Bet right now. If you haven't played there before, use the promo code WST for a 100% bonus up to 200 bucks on your first deposit. Um, great show today, Reem. Fun getting down to the rink. And uh, now it's time to get back to the rink tonight for that 7 o'clock puck drop. And hopefully we'll have a different result than we saw on Tuesday night. Hopefully a different result. Love to see a win. Love to see more than one goal. Uh, like to see Brossois. What can he bring in a Jets uniform? I remember when they LB. signed I remember when they signed him the first time. I'm like, who is this guy? This guy's the backup. And by the end of the season, we're like, he needs to play more games. He's great. Mm -hmm. So we'll have to see how that goes. And we'll get a look at Appleton on the, the top line there, Connor and Shafley. I am, I agree with you, that third line. I don't think they're going to be the third line in minutes. Lowry, I follow, uh, Nita Ryder. I think they're going to be be strong. So uh, we'll see how it goes. And 
I don't know. Hopefully, they. You think they'll boo some members of the Golden Knights? Any bad blood from last playoffs? I did use a picture of Dylan fighting Keegan Colasar in our thumbnail. I figured, figure a fight always gets people people clicking on it. Good click through rate, well, I think. I, I, you know what? I mean, whether there's a fight or not, um, mm-hmm. we want to see the fight in the Jets tonight. Um, uh, we know how disappointed Rick Bonus was for the way the season ended. Um, let's see the pushback tonight for uh, what should be a great test for the Winnipeg Jets, trying to get back in the win column and even their record at 2-2 two and two early in this season. Uh, great show today. Thanks for the lawman for his time and Rasmus Kapari and, of course, Brandon Rowicki and Kenny Weeb. Tomorrow on the program, uh, Billick's going to jump on with us. We'll have Hacksaw. Um, hoping Ed Tate jumps on with us as well to tee up the home finale for the Winnipeg Blue Bombers and uh, and much, much more. That's going to do it for us. Thank you again to the sponsors that make the show happen every day and all of you. If you haven't already, gang, hit that thumbs up. We're at 181. We've had a great crowd all show, so it would be nice to get that to 200. We'd greatly appreciate it if you could just hit that thumbs up. Hit the subscribe button if you haven't already. And join us tomorrow for a full Friday show heading into the weekend and, of course, another Friday Marbles race. Enjoy the game tonight. If you're going to the game, bring the energy. The team's going to need it, and we'll see you tomorrow on WST. Oh, my God! Oh! Shut it down! Let's go home! Thanks for tuning in to Winnipeg Sports Talk Daily. Make sure to subscribe on YouTube and your favorite podcast feed at winnipegsportstalk.com.